Welcome to Fanfiction Audiobook. Marvel. This Magneto is a good guy. Chapter 41. I'm very sorry, but I need to know the truth. Professor X said in a tough tone, and his huge mental power was like a substance, turning into a sharp cone, stabbing Eric's brain fiercely. The magnetic field protection arranged by Eric was like paper, and Professor easily broke it. The condensed mental power forcibly pushed away the electromagnetic radiation, turned into a bullet, broke through the thousands of defenses, and shot at Eric. The first person with psychic power in the world, well deserved. Eric sneered, do you really think I'm a sick cat if the tiger doesn't show its power? He just drew a circle in front of him, and the powerful electromagnetic field around him changed direction instantly, forming a special force field in front of him. The huge energy gathered, and even the starlight around him became a little distorted. Professor X's spirit was like entering a quagmire, unable to move forward or backward. In the end, he had to disperse the condensed mental power again, using a small part of the mental power as bait to lure Eric to continue to block, and most of the mental power barely escaped. Hey, he ran away. Eric raised his eyebrows and discovered Professor X's little trick, but unfortunately he still let most of his mental power escape. The electromagnetic field rotated slowly, and the huge energy crushed and annihilated the mental power trapped in it. At Xavier School for Geniuses, Professor X's body suddenly showed pain, and beads of sweat fell from his bald head, but he still reached out to stop Hank who wanted to help him take off the brainwave enhancer. He had to continue fighting. After failing to succeed in one move, Professor X changed his strategy. The huge mental power was all scattered, becoming ethereal and difficult to figure out, like a soft cloud, slowly surrounding Eric without his noticing. As long as there was a slight loophole in Eric's defense, these mental powers would attack with thunder and lightning. Eric could no longer detect the existence of Professor X's mental power, but his keen perception told him that there was danger all around. If it were an ordinary person, he would not know what to do with this move. The only thing he could do was to go all out, be alert and defend, and respond to changes with the same attitude. He would change from attack to confrontation to see who has more patience. Unfortunately, Professor X didn't know that Eric had the memory of Magneto in two lives, and he had been in love and hatred with Professor X in another universe for two lives. Eric was very familiar with his routines. Eric couldn't help but smile slightly, and shook his head secretly, Charles, you have changed a universe but your moves are still so old-fashioned. Eric waved gently behind him, and a ray of silver light was separated from the giant funnel, which quickly condensed around him. In a blink of an eye, it turned into a hollow sphere, wrapping him in it. A huge electromagnetic pulse was generated from Eric, reflected back by the sphere, penetrated Eric's body, and was reflected by the other sphere, while Eric was constantly releasing new electromagnetic pulses. For a time, the silver hollow sphere was filled with chaotic electromagnetic pulses, each of which contained huge energy. Professor X's mental power was blocked outside and could not advance an inch. Eric learned this trick from Sebastian Shaw's nuclear submarine. At that time, the place where nuclear fuel was stored on Sebastian Shaw's nuclear submarine used this structure to successfully block Professor X's mental power until a small corner was torn open in the melee, and Professor X's mental power was able to enter. Now, Professor X encountered the same dilemma. Relying on the brainwave enhancer, his mental power was enhanced several times, and almost no one on the earth could match it, but he could not break the sphere and could not attack Eric. A dog bites a hedgehog, but there is nowhere to bite. In the silver sphere, Eric was also unable to attack Professor X, but he was not anxious, because he knew that Professor X was about to lose. Calculate the time, it should be about the same. Eric squinted his eyes, carefully sensing the subtle changes in the outside world, and the corners of his mouth gradually turned up. On the huge silver funnel, a ray of electric light suddenly lit up, and countless tiny holes suddenly appeared on the funnel, like holes pierced by countless tiny needles. The second round of solar storm attacks, high-energy charged particles have arrived. High-energy charged particles cannot affect Professor X's mental power, but they can affect the brainwave enhancer. Professor X's mental power suddenly became intermittent, high and low, and occasionally stuck, just like a bad signal. It took less than 10 seconds for Professor X's mental power to fade away like a tide. 
At Xavier School for Geniuses, Professor X took off his helmet with a splitting headache and fell to the ground groaning in pain. Professor. Hank hurried over, picked him up with his furry hands, and put him back on the wheelchair. Hank, what happened? There's something wrong with the brain wave enhancer. Professor X sat weakly in the wheelchair, but his eyes were fixed on the helmet. Professor, the solar storm affected the brain wave enhancer and it can't be used for a short time. Hank quickly checked and quickly came to a conclusion. Professor X looked at the brain wave enhancer unwillingly, his fingers tightly grasped the armrest of the wheelchair, his eyes gradually became firm, and he stretched out his other hand and pressed it on his temple. Professor, what are you doing? Hank was shocked. This action was only done when Professor X was using his superpowers to the fullest. Even with the brainwave enhancer, he couldn't do anything to him. Now he went up to him and confronted him. Isn't this courting death? Hank, I must know the truth about this matter. Professor X closed his eyes, and his surging mental power went to the sky again. Eric had just come out of the hollow ball and felt Professor X's mental power again, but this time, his mental power was several times weaker. Professor Charles, you are so persistent. Eric patted his forehead helplessly. Professor X in this state did not have enough power to spy on his memory, but he still came. I apologize to you for my reckless behavior just now. I'm sorry. But I beg you to tell me the truth, please. Professor X was not as tough as before, and his tone was almost begging. Professor Charles, why are you so persistent? Eric was very curious about Professor X's purpose. At first, he thought that Professor X was fighting for Magneto, his good friend, but now it seems that there seems to be something else. Professor X's mental power was silent for a moment, and then he slowly said, For many years, I found that there is a group of people who are doing experiments on mutants. Isn't this very common? This kind of thing happens every day. Eric has a deep understanding of the experience of mutants. It's different. Professor X's tone gradually became solemn. That group of people is different, they don't seem to hurt mutants, they just extract their genes from their lives and then study them. Is there such a kind villain? Eric was full of disbelief. In this world, are there such gentle villains who study mutants? It's not kindness, they are collecting information about the lives of mutants, they are cloning, no, they are copying mutants. Copy. Even the trajectory of life must be controlled. Which gentleman came up with this, good idea? Eric shook his head slowly, Professor Charles, I can tell you clearly that I am not a clone or copy of anyone. Professor X left with doubts after all. Eric couldn't tell him his biggest secret. After sending Professor X away, Eric repaired the giant funnel behind him again, receiving the energy of the solar storm, and crushed the vampire nests one by one. The progress was very fast. In less than half an hour, all the vampire nests in the United States were visited. Eric did not tell Nick Fury what he had done. After leaving the nest of the vampire Archduke Ellis Machinos, Nick Fury and the Blade Soldier split into two groups again, replenished ammunition and went to the next nest. In this nest, Nick Fury carefully walked around inside and outside, but didn't find a vampire. Puzzled, he led the team to the third nest again, and it was still the same. The fourth. Eric. It must be him. Nick Fury was not a professional fighter after all. Such a high-intensity, battle, made him tired like a grandson. He sat on the ground without any image. No matter how Coulson persuaded him, he just couldn't get up. Throughout history, Europe has always been a disaster area for vampires. Even in a small country like the UK, Eric has uncovered more than 600 nests. Under a certain abandoned castle in the UK, a group of vampires are actually holding some kind of mysterious ceremony. They are standing in a circle, with a mysterious magic circle carved on the ground, flashing an evil light. Several bloody humans are surrounded by vampires in the center, and blood is flowing along the lines of the magic circle, and it seems that the entire magic circle is about to be filled. It seems that the Earl is very satisfied with this sacrifice. A female vampire looked at the humans in the magic circle, her eyes seemed to be looking at a pile of goods, and she was very satisfied with the quality of the goods. Several other vampires also showed joy on their faces. A vampire who looked a little older asked for credit with a proud face. Look, what did I say? The Earl will definitely like the blood of Atlanteans. Next time, we will catch Atlanteans again. The female vampire nodded, 
Yes, Yasa, you will be responsible for the hunt next time. Yasa suddenly wilted, shrank his head and shook his head. My lord, I can't beat Namor. I didn't ask you to fight, you just need to. Before he finished speaking, a hot storm suddenly rushed over, and the silver particles mixed in the storm quickly pierced the bodies of several vampires. Before they figured out what happened, they all turned into ashes. The storm wandered around the nest, confirmed that there were no vampires, and flew out from a vent. Without the controller, the magic circle on the ground lost its luster, and the blood stopped flowing. At this time, it was only a little distance away from the blood flowing all over the magic circle. Unfortunately, the ritual failed in the end. The blood on the ground dried up instantly, and several Atlanteans in the magic circle dried up visibly, and turned into mummies in the blink of an eye. Under the magic circle, there was a shocking roar, and a dry arm broke the ground and stretched out from the center of the magic circle. Who is it? Disturbing the great Dracula's sleep. Eric was not aware of the changes in the UK, and his attention had long been shifted to other places. The solar storm cannot last long, and time is running out. He must seize every minute and every second. Britain, France, Germany. Then Asia, Africa. Except for some sensitive places, Eric swept away all the vampire nests on the earth before the solar storm ended. There are no more vampires in the world. Eric put his hands behind his back looked down at the earth under his feet, and sneered with a hint of disdain at the corner of his mouth. In a parallel universe, Scarlet Witch said, there are no more mutants in the world, which made all mutants in the world lose their superpowers. Eric didn't have such powerful abilities as hers, so the only purpose of his words was to show off, or show off without an audience. Hey, no one gave me flowers, so it's okay to just clap. After posing for a long time, Eric shrugged his shoulders in boredom and complained. He didn't even think about whether he would be scared to death if someone really applauded him now. The giant funnel shrank quickly and turned into two silver dragons again in a short while. Without the energy gathering device, Eric felt extremely weak instantly. It's easy to go from frugality to luxury, but it's hard to go from luxury to frugality. Accustomed to always maintaining a full and powerful energy, Eric really couldn't adapt to the feeling of having to rely on his own superpowers for a while. It would be great if there were solar storms every day. Eric looked at the fiery red sun with envy, and couldn't help smacking his lips twice. Back on Earth, Eric deliberately avoided Nick Fury and his group and appeared quietly at the door of the New York Temple. The door of the temple slowly opened a gap, just enough for him to enter. Master Ji Yu Yi, are there still vampires in the world? If you don't get rid of the roots, they will grow again in the spring breeze. As long as there is one vampire, it is possible to spread all over the world again, so Eric plans to get rid of the roots. Yes. Ji Yu Yi's appearance has not changed at all. Even though it is not spring yet, she still holds the small fan and fans the wind from time to time. Ji Yu Yi's answer did not surprise Eric. He knew that there would always be one or two lucky people in the world, even their vampires. Where? A sharp light flashed in Eric's eyes, and murderous intent was revealed in his voice. Ji Yu Yi closed the fan and tilted his head to look at Eric, making him feel creepy. He didn't know how he had angered this great god again. Eric, you can't kill all the vampires. Why? Eric's eyes widened. Ji Yu Yi smiled and threw the fan in his hand forward. The fan exploded in the air and turned into a ball of golden runes. The runes tumbled quickly and turned into a light curtain. Above the light curtain, a withered hand stretched out from the ground. The nails on the hand were as black as ink, and the skin was as dry as bark. Then, a thing shaped like a mummy rushed out from the ground. He looked like he could be blown down by any gust of wind, but he moved as fast as lightning. Eric frowned and looked at the light screen. He always felt that this place was familiar. He recalled quickly and it took him a long time to figure out that this seemed to be a nest he had cleared, but he couldn't remember where it was. There were too many nests. The mummy was like a ghost, completely unafraid of the sun. After biting two people to death on the street, his skin swelled up like it was inflated. In just a few minutes, he recovered into a somewhat feminine man. From his two pairs of sharp teeth, it was obviously a vampire. Is he the only one left? I'll go kill him. After watching him suck the blood of two people with his own eyes, Eric felt indescribable disgust for this vampire. 
You can't kill him. Ji Yuyi waved his hand gently and put away the fan. Why? Because he is Dracula. Dracula, the second generation vampire ancestor. The first generation vampire ancestor was the Atlantis wizard Varner, who used the magic in the dark book to transform himself into a vampire. Here we have to talk about the dark book, which belongs to the god of black magic, Sithos. The magic of the scarlet which comes from Sithos. The dark book contains the magic of Sithos. Everyone who gets it sees different things in the book, and the great wizard Varner just saw the magic of transforming vampires. After being transformed into a vampire, Varner gained powerful power and a long life. He lived too long, experienced too much, and even witnessed the sinking of Atlantis with his own eyes. Then, Varner saw through the world and chose to commit suicide. Before dying, Varner passed all his power to Dracula, and since then Dracula began to rule the vampire clan. Dracula is a second-generation vampire who has obtained the power of Varna. In addition to his super physique, he can also perform illusion, hypnosis, transfiguration, and a small amount of black magic. But this is not the point. The point is that he has a special ability, that is, resurrection, perfect resurrection. No matter how he dies, he can be perfectly resurrected, without any weakening of strength or lack of memory. All he needs is to wait for a while. Dracula's perfect resurrection is like a rule in the Marvel Universe. No one can break it, not even the goddess of death. Dracula, it's a bit difficult. Eric touched his chin and frowned in thought. Self-healing, recovery, resurrection, this type of ability is the most disgusting among superpowers. Think about Shao Zhangjian, why can he become more and more mean? Isn't it because he can heal himself no matter how many injuries he has, and no one can do anything to him? Now he encounters the more disgusting infinite resurrection, which really stumps Eric. First of all, you can't kill people directly. It's useless to kill them and resurrect them. Secondly, he cannot be sealed. If you seal him, he will kill himself and become a brave man again after a while. However, this Dracula cannot be left alone. If he is left alone, he will infect a large number of vampires in a few days. Master Ji Yu Yi, do you have any way to solve the problem of Dracula? Since he can't solve it himself, he can just hug his thigh. If he doesn't hug his thigh, he will lose money. But Ji Yu Yi shook his head, I'm sorry, Eric, I can't kill Dracula either. Then use the mirror dimension to trap him forever. Eric didn't plan to give up. He can choose to commit suicide. Ji Yu Yi shook his head again. How about using a portal to make him fall all the time? He can turn into a bat, he can fly. Ji Yu Yi's expression became a little weird. Then use the time gem to make him fall into a time loop. Ji Yu Yi didn't answer again, looking at Eric with a smile. Eric saw this expression and subconsciously shrank his neck. Master, why are you looking at me like that? You seem to know my magic very well. Uh, generally, generally, he he. Eric laughed awkwardly twice and didn't dare to say anything more. What can he say? Could he tell Ancient One that when he was in the Emperor Thanos universe, he studied Doctor Strange as an imaginary enemy for a whole year in order to grab the ultimate eraser? Speaking of the ultimate eraser, I wonder if this thing can erase Dracula. Ancient One shook his fan and stopped delving into the matter. Eric, maybe you should ask your old friend. Old friend. Xavier School of Geniuses. After many years, across two universes, Eric stood in front of the two familiar doors again. The exquisite door seemed to lack maintenance and was a little rusty. Several plants had vines wrapped around the door, and it looked like it hadn't been opened for a long time. Boss. Boss. You're really here. Great. Eric was still sighing outside the gate, when a roar of joy suddenly came from inside the gate, followed by a roar like an explosion. Red Tank ran all the way, and the ground shook violently as he ran. Marco, stop. Eric hurriedly stopped Red Tank. If he was allowed to rush over like this, the gate of Xavier School of Geniuses would have to be replaced with a new one. After not seeing each other for a year, Red Tank seemed to be stronger than before. It seemed that Charles did not treat his half-brother badly. Is Charles here? To be honest, he just lost face and came to ask for help from him immediately. He was really a little embarrassed. Charles. I don't know, who cares? Let's go find Sammy. If Sammy knew you were here, he would be very happy. 
Eric rolled his eyes when he heard it. In Sammy's eyes, he was probably at the same level as the devil in hell. He was still happy. It was good enough that he didn't cry. Mr. Eric, I never thought that you would be the one who saved these children. Thank you for your kindness. I apologize again for my rude behavior just now. Professor X did not use his superpowers this time, and thanked Eric very sincerely. Professor Charles, there is no need to do this. I think no matter who sees the plight of these children, they will not stand idly by. Eric took the coffee handed over by Hank and smiled friendly. Why did Mr. Eric come to Xavier Academy for Geniuses this time? After Hank delivered the coffee, he walked naturally behind Professor X. He seemed humble, but in fact he was always ready to protect Professor X. Hearing Hank's question, Eric rubbed his nose in embarrassment. I came to Xavier Academy for the gifted this time. Firstly, I wanted to see Marco and the children. Secondly, I wanted to ask Professor Charles for help. Two small favors. Oh, do you need my help? What is it? Find one person and arrest another person. After hearing this, Professor. It doesn't matter if it's broken, I'll just fix it for you. Eric's words made Professor X and Hank's eyes widen. What do you think the brainwave intensifier is? Can anyone cultivate it? You thought that was changing a light bulb. Do you know how to build a brainwave enhancement device? Professor. Professor Charles, you have seen my abilities. Eric smiled easily. Furthermore, I have my own technology company, and I developed the world's first room temperature superconducting material. I believe I have enough technology to repair it. It. Hank wanted to reject Eric's proposal directly, but Professor stopped him. He frowned and thought for a moment, then nodded and agreed, okay, then there's Mr. Eric. The brainwave enhancement device is one of the core secrets of Xavier Academy for Geniuses. Under normal circumstances, it is difficult for outsiders to get a full view of it. But today, Eric, an outsider, looked at it inside and out. The brainwave enhancement device was like a poor and helpless sister-in-law, with tearful eyes and pleading, but the gangster Eric didn't care about the sister-in-law's feelings at all, and stripped it naked with a grin. Not only that, he even wanted to strip my sister-in-law's skin and cramps in an extremely cold-blooded manner. The above is the picture that Hank, the technical geek beast, imagined. Hank. Why are you so scared? Go and help. Professor. Sorry, Professor, I'll go right away. Hank knew very well that going up to help was a lie, and asking him to keep an eye on Eric to prevent him from making any small moves was the real thing. You must not have the intention of harming others, and you must have the intention of guarding against others. Eric glanced at Hank and knew their thoughts very clearly. He smiled and shook his head, but did not refuse his help. Hank, help me find some aluminum and iron, and a small amount of silver and zinc. What does it need to be processed into? My laboratory can process it. Hank still doesn't know what Eric's power is. Eric smiled and shook his head, opened his hands, and slowly floated up. No need, you just need to find the materials. You are a mutant too. Hank was surprised. Professor. Then what is he? Hank said without hesitation, and immediately realized his mistake, oh, sorry, I mean, what kind of race is he? Why can he fly? Hank, I can do more than fly. Eric looked down at the two of them, feeling very happy. Perhaps because he had too many memories of Magneto, he enjoyed Professor look up to the king. Mr. Eric, are your abilities hereditary? I have read your report. Does your father, Charles Lanchier, also have these abilities? Hank's question almost made Eric drop. The little sense of superiority he had just gained was completely wiped out by the words, your father, Charles Lanchier. I must have had a brain twitch at that time. Yes, it must have been a brain twitch. No, it was Magneto who had a brain twitch. Eric's mouth twitched, and he kept finding the steps for himself. At the same time, he also started working on his hands intending to use this to attract Hank's attention and make him forget about, Daddy Charles. Indeed, as he expected, Hank was completely shocked when he removed a steel plate from the brainwave intensifier with a wave of his hand, and then split the steel plate into several small pieces with a few fingers. Is this telekinesis? Or, it's electromagnetic force. Professor X had just fought with Eric and was very familiar with his abilities. Electromagnetic force. How is it possible? Hank was shocked, and he forgot about, Daddy Charles. 
No, Marx also used the name Eric Lenscher. How could there be such a coincidence in the world? The thing is, he is. I'm not sure who he is, but he personally admitted that he is not a clone. Professor, why don't you look at his memory? Maybe. Professor. Hank. Hank, what are you talking about? Have you found the materials? The two of them did not use psychic powers in these conversations. Eric, who has a keen hearing, heard these words really. Professor X admitted that they were not his. Opponent, he almost laughed like a pig. Oh, sorry, I'll go right away. This steel plate contains a large amount of cosmic radiation. It is difficult to remove and can no longer be used. I will replace it for you. How many years have you used this cable? It's burned like this and you still use it. You're not afraid of catching fire. The capacity of this transformer is a bit small. Hank, is there a larger one? What? No. It doesn't matter. Prepare some copper and I'll rub one for you on site. In the shocked eyes of Professor. Eric explained that this was something he sensed with his superpower, but Professor X and Hank didn't believe it at all. In less than an hour, the brainwave enhancement device took on a new look. Not only the damage suffered this time was repaired, but also some hidden injuries accumulated in the past were repaired. The current brainwave intensifier is exactly the same as the new one. Beast Hank can also repair this thing, but he doesn't have Eric's powers, so he can only repair it bit by bit and replace it bit by bit. If he wants to do it all over again, he won't be able to get it off at all within 3 to 5 months. When Professor X sat on the console and held the helmet in both hands, Beast Hank stood on his left and Eric stood on his right. His hands couldn't help but tremble a little. Decades ago, when Magneto and Hank built this brainwave enhancement device together, they stood in this position and looked at him like this. Everything seemed to have returned to that time. Professor. Various figures appeared on the inner wall of the brainwave intensifier, and they were the people Professor X had encountered. The figures kept increasing, most of them were gray and almost transparent, those were ordinary people. Some of the figures were special red, those were mutants. Professor X carefully searched according to the information Eric gave him, and soon locked the target. It was a little girl, about six or seven years old. Her figure was gray, which meant that she was an ordinary human, not a mutant. Not a mutant, strange. Professor X obviously had mutant paranoia, perhaps every time he used the brainwave enhancer, it was related to mutants. Now he was asked to find an ordinary human, but he felt strange. Huh. No. What is that? Professor X's mental power circled the little girl twice. He was about to withdraw, but suddenly found something unusual. There was some blue light hidden in the gray figure of the little girl, which he had never noticed before. Those blue lights were like tiny stars, deeply hidden in the little girl's body. If he hadn't observed it carefully, he would not have found it. Sure enough, how could the person Eric is looking for be an ordinary person? Professor X did not study the blue light anymore. After noting the location of the little girl, he continued to look for the next target, Count Dracula. It's easier to find someone. That dark and evil mind is like a pile of feces. It emits bursts of stench in this spiritual world. It will take Professor X a minute to find it. Found it. Dracula is in the UK. I'll give you his coordinates. Professor X took off his helmet and opened his eyes, only to find Hank pouring coffee for Eric. Uh, Professor, I thought you would need a long time. Hank hurriedly poured a cup for Professor X. After Eric's repair, the brainwave enhancer is better than before, with a wider coverage and less energy consumption. Eric, thank you again. You're welcome. I should do it. Is Dracula still in the UK? Then I'll go there first. As he said that, Eric put down the coffee he had just picked up and was about to leave. Eric, finish your coffee first. Hank hurriedly stopped him. Eric glanced at him and tossed his sleeves domineeringly. Keep the coffee, I'll be back soon. With the precise coordinates provided by Professor X, Eric took off directly from the spot and headed straight for the UK. Britain, isn't it a little far away? In the air, Eric constantly corrected the direction through the geomagnetic field, sensing the distance of the target, and swallowed his saliva involuntarily. This seems to be a bit too much, I don't know if the little thing can last until I come back. Eric added some ingredients to the cup of coffee before leaving. A small piece of iron was stuffed with a lot of energy by him using his supernatural power. 
This energy was obtained when repairing the brain wave enhancer. It was the high energy charged particles that remained on the brain wave enhancer after passing through. There were all kinds of messy radiation in this energy. He couldn't deal with it for a while, so he sealed it on the iron sheet, solidified a magnetic field, and slowly consumed the radiation. This process will be accompanied by heat release, but it is unknown how long it will last. In ancient times, the second master warmed wine and killed Hua Shang. Today, I, Eric, warm coffee and catch vampires. Ah, uh, it doesn't rhyme. Forget it. Eric shrugged, put aside the distracting thoughts in his mind, and hurried on his way. Gliding along the magnetic lines, Eric's speed was not fast, and he didn't even reach the speed of sound. He realized this problem after flying for a few minutes. At his speed, it would take a day to go to the UK. What's the point of pretending? Okay, I've said it, let's do it fiercely. Eric gritted his teeth, turned on the magnetic field shield, turned on his superpowers, magnetized the anti-magnetic atoms in his body, and then induced the magnetic field to repel the Earth's magnetism. This is something Eric is very reluctant to do, because it's too strenuous. However, it's really fast to do this. It only takes a few seconds to break the sound barrier. If other flying methods are added, his speed can theoretically reach close to the speed of light. Bang. There was a loud bang in the air, and Eric instantly soared into the sky. The sonic boom cloud was blocked outside by the magnetic field shield, but the harsh sound kept echoing in his ears. Even at supersonic speed, Eric still took more than two hours to reach his destination. This is an old church, located in a remote area with few people. The dark red exterior walls are covered with moss, and countless vines have grown on the stained glass of the windows, blocking half of the face of the Virgin Mary. Eric walked into the church. The ground was full of dust and there was a strong smell of mold. The sunlight shone through the colorful glass and projected on the ground, making the entire interior of the church mottled. Dracula sat in the first row, holding his chin with both hands, staring at the statue of Jesus in a daze, and I don't know what he was thinking. Eric slowly approached, looking at the entire legendary vampire while thinking about how to deal with him. Dracula's strength is not that strong. Captain America, Thor, Blade, etc., many heroes have killed him alone. There was even a time when Dracula and the Avengers confronted each other. He would go to the Avengers to cause trouble every once in a while, and then he would be killed every time. After he died, he would resurrect to cause trouble again, and then he would be easily killed again. In order to solve the problem of vampires, Eric couldn't kill him. It would be troublesome if he killed him and let him run to another place to resurrect. He couldn't always wait for Professor X to help him find someone. Dracula looked the same as described in most stories, with a black tuxedo, a scarlet cloak, a pale complexion, sharp nails, and sharp teeth that would show when he opened his mouth. Do you think God really exists? When Eric walked to the third row, Dracula, who had been thinking about life, asked without thinking. Eric raised his eyebrows and sat down behind him, unfortunately, you asked the wrong person. I am a Jew and don't believe in Jesus. I hope God really exists, so that he can kill me. Dracula's voice was ethereal, and it seemed that every word revealed a bloody smell. Oh. You want to die. I can help you. Eric was surprised by Dracula's words. Could it be that this gentleman has also seen through the world like Varner? No, I just want to be killed by God, or kill God. Dracula's eyes lit up with a ray of red light, and he suddenly turned around and punched Eric. Hey. Brother, I'm not God. Eric grabbed his fist and squeezed it hard, secretly slandering in his heart, look at how good he is at pretending. He made it seem like he could kill God with just a flick of his hand, and he got angry all of a sudden. Humph. Those who can come to me are either from the church or vampire hunters. No matter which side, I will send you to see God. Dracula laughed grimly, his body suddenly shrank, turned into a ball of black mist, escaped from Eric's hand, and disappeared. Eric curled his lips, stretched out his hand and waved it gently, and a ball of silver mist floated from him and scattered. Ah. Dracula fell from the sky and turned back to his original appearance. Silver could not bring much substantial damage to Dracula. He just slept for many years and was not used to the pain caused by silver. Dracula stood up and stared at Eric fiercely, muttering something, and a ball of black mist rolled rapidly in his hands. 
Eric immediately perked up. Magic was the area he was least good at, not to mention the evil black magic, which had to be prevented. He quickly turned on the magnetic field shield and added silver particles. Dracula's magic quickly took shape, and the black mist turned into a short black arrow, shooting straight at Eric. The short arrow reached Eric in the blink of an eye, and the magnetic field shield did not react at all. The black arrow passed through the shield like a shadow. Eric's pupils shrank, and he subconsciously stretched out his hand to block the arrow. Dracula sneered, as if he had seen Eric's tragic death. Ding! With a crisp sound, a silver luster appeared on Eric's palm. It was the vibranium hidden in his cells, which was concentrated by him. After missing the attack, Dracula's face became gloomy. The cloak behind him swayed slightly, and countless bats flew out. He himself turned into a bat, mixed in the group of bats and bit Eric. These bats seemed to have black magic on their teeth, and Eric's shield was bitten into thousands of holes in a few seconds. He hurriedly retreated, and at the same time, his palms slammed together fiercely. A large amount of electric light overflowed from his palms, turning into lightning, and knocked down a large number of bats. With cannon fodder bats resisting the attack, Dracula flashed by lightning one by one, flew behind Eric, turned into a human form again, grabbed Eric's shoulder, opened his bloody mouth and bit down fiercely. Eric did not stop him, but just mobilized the vibranium over. Ding! With a light sound, Dracula covered his mouth and retreated quickly. Hey, you have good teeth. How does vibranium taste? Eric laughed. Dracula's face was gloomy, his eyes glowed red, and a dark and strange mental power spread towards Eric. Hypnosis. Ha ha, compared to Charles, you are a scum. Although he said so, Eric did not dare to be careless at all. The mental power mixed with black magic, who knows how it is different from Charles's. Eric carefully opened several magnetic field protections, and his hands continuously emitted electromagnetic pulses to force away the mental power approaching him, and then waved his hands again, and a ball of silver mist condensed into several metal balls the size of quail eggs. He drew circles with his hands, and the electromagnetic field was superimposed layer by layer. The metal ball flashed with bursts of electric light and shot out fiercely. Electromagnetic Cannon this is the electromagnetic cannon simulated by Eric. The metal ball carried a huge force and hit Dracula like lightning. Before Dracula could react, several holes were pierced through his right leg. He could not stand up and knelt on one knee. However, in those holes, you can see the granulation tissue wriggling, and the wound is shrinking rapidly. It will take him a few minutes to recover. Ah! Dracula roared in anger, stretched out his hand and slapped the ground to stand up. Eric didn't want him to get his wish, so he gathered a metal ball in his hand again and hit him. Eric didn't dare to use his killing move, and the electromagnetic cannon was aimed at Dracula's limbs. Soon, Dracula's limbs were covered with scars. Eric struck while the iron was hot, and the metal ball turned into silver mist again, wrapping Dracula in it. See if you are still not honest. Eric clenched his fist fiercely, and the silver mist tightened immediately, turning into a thin silver film covering Dracula tightly, binding him tightly. Dracula can survive in a vacuum environment, and Eric is not worried that he will be suffocated. Then, he opened his hands, and metal kept flying around, turning into powder in the air and gathering on Dracula. Soon, Dracula was buried under a thick layer of metal and turned into a big iron lump. Done. Eric smiled with satisfaction, controlling the big iron lump to fly up and prepare to fly back to the United States. However, a wisp of black smoke suddenly emerged from the iron lump, which immediately froze Eric's smile. Human, you have successfully angered the great Count Dracula. The black fog kept swirling in the air, and finally condensed into the appearance of Dracula again, but he looked a little miserable, with holes everywhere on his tuxedo and cloak, and white and black patches on his pale skin. Tisk tisk, what a standard villain boss declaration. When this sentence appears in the game, the boss is usually at low health and is ready to explode a big move before dying. Eric saw Dracula's appearance and laughed again. Dracula didn't understand what Eric said, but he could understand the mocking smile on his face, and he was immediately furious. Stupid human, how dare you laugh at the great Count Dracula. With a roar, Dracula turned into a ball of black mist again, 
with dark and strange lights flashing in the black mist, and a few obscure magic runes flashing from time to time. Oh, are you really going to use your ultimate power? I just said it casually, don't take it seriously. Eric complained, and his hands were not idle. After the battle just now, he saw that his magnetic shield had little effect on Dracula's magic, but it could block physical objects. In the blink of an eye, the big iron lump on the ground rose into the air again, split, and combined, and soon turned into a steel armor, which was automatically put on Eric. This armor does not have the sharp mechanical feel of the Mark series, but the biomass feel of muscle tissue, as if he had put on another layer of steel muscle. Eric's height, which was not low to begin with, broke through two meters after putting on the steel armor. Coupled with the steel muscles, he looked like an alien monster no matter how he looked at it. I am steel. Forget it, this line is exclusive to him, it's not appropriate for me to say it. Eric shook his huge head and waved his huge fist to hit Dracula. Dracula's magic was also ready, and dark red light emerged from the black fog and shot at Eric like a laser weapon. Unfortunately, after these magic red lights hit the steel muscles, they were directly smashed and dissipated. The only trace left was the, ding ding, sound after the hit. At this time, Eric's iron fist hit the black fog, which was like a real fog, without any texture, but was beaten up and down, and even the magic was not interrupted. In the black fog, Dracula laughed strangely, eerie and terrifying, as if he was laughing at Eric's ignorance. HMPH, do you think this is the end? Ridiculous. Eric's iron fist suddenly opened in the center of the black fog, and countless spikes grew rapidly, exceeding the range of the black fog in an instant. From the outside, Dracula's deformed black fog looked like a sea urchin. This move also did not cause any harm to Dracula. He was almost immune to all physical attacks when he turned into this black fog state, but he suddenly had an ominous premonition and was eager to escape from the range of the steel spikes. Too late. Eric shouted, and a few flashes of lightning flashed in his eyes. I saw bursts of lightning flashing on the steel spikes. The lightning quickly intensified, but in the blink of an eye, the sea urchin turned into a lightning ball. Dracula's black fog seemed to be in a sea of lightning, emitting bursts of painful howls, and the black fog kept churning. In some places, he even involuntarily turned back into a human form. The sound of thunder was endless. Dracula tried to rush out of the lightning ball several times, but Eric blocked him with more powerful lightning. Dracula's screams became quieter and quieter. Eric was afraid that he might kill him accidentally, so he put away the lightning and steel spikes. Without the lightning attack, the black fog instantly turned back into human form, and Dracula lay on the ground, dying. Finally he's behaving well this time. Eric reached out and patted Dracula's head, and a strong electromagnetic pulse hit him, and Dracula fainted instantly. When Eric returned to Xavier School of the Gifted with the unconscious Dracula, it was already late at night. Professor X and Hank were not asleep, waiting for his return. Eric threw Dracula on the ground casually, Hank, is my coffee still there? Yes, you said to let you keep it, so I didn't move it. The tech geek Hank pointed to the desk next to him, and there was Eric's cup of spiked coffee on it, which made Eric sigh, what a simple-minded person. Take a rest first, I'll heat it up for you. Hank, who was honest, really thought Eric wanted to drink the coffee, so he walked over and picked it up. But as soon as he touched the coffee cup, he frowned, his nose twitched slightly, and looked at the coffee in his hand with some confusion. Hank, what's wrong? Professor X asked in confusion. The coffee is still warm, but it seems to be sour. Is this Dracula? A vampire? Professor. The Xavier family is a family with a long history. They have many records of various anecdotes. Naturally, they also know a lot about vampire legends. Professor X has read many vampire records from books, but he is also the first real vampire. Seeing it for the first time, I was inevitably a little curious. That's right, Charles, this guy is exactly the same as in the records. It's really miraculous that he can turn into a bat. Eric kicked Dracula, who was like a dead pig. With Professor X around, he was not afraid of him waking up again. Change into a bat. It's interesting. Among mutants, many can transform, but they usually change their appearance, and few can change their body size. Professor Middle. Eric curled his lips and thought, he must have thought of Mystique again. 
He looked at Hank again to see if he was also reminiscing, but when he saw it, Eric immediately stared, Hank. Put down the syringe in your hand. We agreed not to draw blood. Hank hurriedly hid the syringe behind his back and looked at Eric pleadingly, Eric, this is the last vampire in the world. I will draw a little blood and do a simple genetic sequencing. It will definitely you won't mess around, I promise. You promise it's useless. We have already discussed this issue. You can guarantee that you will not do random research, but can you guarantee that Dracula's blood samples and the information you research are absolutely safe? What if they are leaked? Can you or you guarantee that those who get the blood will not conduct forbidden research? Eric snatched away his syringe, crumpled it into a ball, and threw it into the trash can. Hank swallowed and looked at Dracula with greedy eyes. The look in his eyes, just like looking at a big girl, made Eric very suspicious of his orientation. Hank, Eric is right. Mutants have enough troubles already. It's better for us not to touch creatures like vampires. Professor X was interrupted from recalling and stopped him. Well, alas, what a pity. Knowing that he would definitely not be able to obtain a blood sample, Hank's face was filled with regret. Charles, let's get started. If you delay for too long, you will inevitably have long nights and dreams. Eric didn't want another accident to happen now, so he urged Professor X. Good. A group of three people and one ghost came to the brainwave enhancement device again. Professor. Neither Eric nor Hank can help with the next work and can only wait. Professor. A large number of memory fragments appear on the wall. Some are dancing with a richly dressed lady, some are fighting the enemy on the battlefield, some are preying on humans for food, and some are alone and staring at the moon in a daze. Dracula lived an extremely long life and had a very rich memory. Eric and Hank watched his memories and commented from time to time, just like watching a movie. They had full confidence in Professor X and were not worried at all that he would fail. This was indeed the case, but in just over 10 minutes, the scene around the brainwave intensifier quickly faded. Professor. What's it like, Charles? It went very well. Professor moreover, in order to make him less boring, I have laid many memory loop traps for him in each layer of the mental cage. If nothing happens, he will be trapped in his own memory for a long time. Quote. Is it possible for him to break out of the mental prison on his own? Professor. That's good. Eric breathed a long sigh of relief, and a big stone finally fell to the ground in his heart. But what if someone helps him? Hank raised his doubts. Eric suddenly laughed, help him. Who? No one will know where he is. No one. When Eric brought Dracula to the New York temple, Yi had already prepared a cup of tea and was waiting here. Master, you are truly a person who has time in your hands. You can be one step ahead in everything. Eric tasted the fragrant tea carefully and couldn't help but admire. Yi was stunned after hearing this. She frowned and thought for a long time before sighing, Eric, sometimes knowing too much is not a good thing. Maybe I was wrong. Ah, what's wrong? Eric was confused. Nothing, let's not mention it. Ji Yi shook his head and did not intend to continue on this topic. Eric, your old friend is indeed very powerful. I checked the future. Within a thousand years, Dracula will be dead. There are less than a thousand futures to come back. A thousand. So many. Eric was shocked. A thousand futures means that Dracula has at least close to a thousand ways to get out of trouble. He thought this was already foolproof. There are no absolutes in this world. It's great that you can do this. Ji Yi smiled and pointed at Dracula on the ground. It's very cold over there, aren't you going to put some clothes on for him? When Eric heard this, he smiled wickedly, you're right, he really needs to wear some clothes. After that, Eric waved his hand and summoned a large piece of metal, which was the one he had prepared to trap Dracula. He pointed at the metal, and the metal spun rapidly, with handfuls of metal particles falling off the surface and spinning around Dracula. When the metal was completely decomposed, Eric put his hands together, and the metal particles in the air instantly gathered into an irregular metal block with pits and pits, wrapping Dracula in the middle. From a distance, it looked like a meteorite. Eric looked at his masterpiece, frowned slightly, and took out another bean-sized metal particle, and evenly attached the paper to the surface of the metal block. Vibranium. Ji Yi looked at the thin layer of silver and was a little surprised. Yes, master, I spent a lot of money. You have to throw him away. Eric looked painful. 
Ancient One shook his head and smiled, slapped the metal block hard, and a yellow and green magic light flashed, and the metal block disappeared without a trace. Master, did you throw it far enough? Can anyone find him? It won't be long before he leaves the Milky Way. Ancient One smiled, flipped his palm, and conjured up a bag of things and handed it to Eric, this is the tea I picked for you. You can drink more when you have time. It can help you calm down. Eric hurriedly took it and bowed, thank you, master, I will be very respectful. A cup of tea, a bright light, accompany me. Street. Agnes Orphanage. The spring sunshine shines on the corridor, dispelling the cold that lasted for several days. New buds sprouted from the branches nearby, and a few birds landed happily on the branches. A little girl sat alone on the railing, her head lowered, her face completely covered by her thick black hair, her hands tightly wrapped around her clothes, and she looked not in a good mood. Under the black hair, a delicate little face was tightly tensed, and his teeth were biting his lips, which actually produced a few strands of blood. She just sat quietly, but it seemed as if there was a gap separating her from the world, not interfering with or affecting each other. At this time, a little boy walked over with a blind cane. His eyes were tightly closed, and there were a few scars on the corners of his eyes. It seemed that he had an accident. Although invisible, the little boy moved very quickly, as if he was very familiar with this place. Sky, long time no see. I heard they said you were back again, so I guessed you must be here. The little boy sat next to the little girl familiarly and patted her shoulder gently, Sky, don't be sad. Everything will get better. Matt, I was sent back by my foster family, again. Sky finally raised her head, her eyes were red and her nose was trembling, but she stubbornly refused to cry. Matt smiled, grabbed her hand and put it on his eyes, at least you have been out, at least you can see the outside world, right? Matt, I'm sorry, Sky finally cried, crying on Matt's shoulder. Matt still had a sunny smile on his face, patted her on the head, and comforted her softly, it's okay, everything will be fine together. In the dean's office, a young couple sat across from the dean. The husband frowned, folded his hands on his chest, and said nothing. The wife was sobbing softly and wiping her tears constantly. The dean looked around helplessly and said, Mr. Jones, are you really not thinking about it anymore? Jones was silent for a long time, then slowly shook his head, Miss Dean, we really tried our best. Mrs. Jones burst into tears immediately, complaining while crying, Miss Dean, woo-woo, we really like her. We don't have children of our own, we only adopted her, and we did everything we could for her. However, she just can't integrate into our lives. She always stares in the mirror and never takes the initiative to say a word at home. We take her to the playground, fishing at the lake, picnics, and museums every week. We play with her every day after get off work, tell her stories, and teach her cooking, painting, and piano. We really she did everything, but she never took the initiative to talk to us. She never even smiled at us. She couldn't integrate into our lives at all. Jones took over and talked about his efforts, his hands unconscious. Waving in the air, his brows furrowed deeper and deeper. Okay. The dean sighed, when you came to adopt her a year ago, I told you that this was how she was in the last foster home. We really thought that as long as we paid, we would be rewarded, but... Jones put down his hand weakly, with a very frustrated expression. I understand. I will handle the procedures for you too. The dean sat up straight and looked at the couple with a smile. So Mr. Jones and Mrs. Jones, what are your plans? Are you willing to re-adopt a child? An orphan? Of course. Mrs. Jones stopped crying and looked at the dean with red eyes, her tone was very firm, this is also one of the purposes of our coming again. We need a child. So, what are your requirements? Is it still the same as last time? The dean stood up and took out a thick amount of information from the cabinet next to him. Yes, just like last time, we need a healthy daughter. Jones stared closely at the information in the dean's hand, eager to know who would be his future daughter. The dean rummaged through the information for a moment, then handed a copy of the information to the two of them, what do you think of her? Jones hurriedly took the information, opened it and looked at the photo in the upper right corner at first glance, oh, my god, she is so beautiful. Yes, Jones, look at her nose, it looks exactly like yours. 
Mrs. Jones pointed to the little girl in the photo, her face full of surprise. Yes, her eyes are very similar to yours. Madam Dean, what's her name? Can we meet her? Of course, her name is Jessica. Mr. and Mrs. Jones finally took away their adopted daughter. The dean returned to the office, looked at Skye's information on the table, and sighed helplessly. She walked to the window and looked out, and could faintly see the lonely figure on the railing of the corridor. Skye, why don't you cherish these opportunities? Only a small part of the children in the orphanage can be adopted. Most children will not be adopted even if they reach adulthood, but you gave up twice. The dean stood in front of the window and murmured to herself. The glass was stained with a layer of white mist from her breath. She slowly wiped away a small piece in the middle, revealing the lonely figure. She murmured with some distress, Yes. I don't know if anyone will adopt you. Of course. A voice suddenly came from behind her, scaring her so much that she almost fell down. Oh, sorry, ma'am. A tall figure quickly ran over, helped her up and put her on a chair. I saw that the door was open, so I came in. I'm sorry for scaring you. It's okay, it's okay, the dean gasped, you are. Let me introduce myself. I am Eric Lanchier, a Polish hereditary baron and the president of Alice Industries. Eric stood up straight, straightened his clothes, and showed a Colson-style smile, making himself look very friendly, I want to adopt that girl, Sky. Uh, why? You may not know that she was just sent back by the foster family, she. Madam, I have learned about her information, but I still want to adopt her. Eric interrupted the dean in a firm tone. The dean looked at him suspiciously, Sir, can I see your driver's license or passport first? Eric's smile froze on his face. He was too eager to show it, and people thought he was a bad guy. Eric had to take out his information and explain it to the dean, so that she believed that he was not a bad guy. Mr. Eric, why do you have to adopt her? She's not easy to get along with. Because she's very important to me. Just think of it as fate. You see, we're both half Chinese, aren't we? Eric looked out the window and saw the lonely figure. Finally I found you. Sky, this will be your home from now on. How about it? It's cool. Eric stood proudly in front of his villa, showing off to his adopted daughter. Sky was indeed shocked. She had lived in an orphanage as long as she could remember, and the two foster families before and after were only middle class. In her short seven or eight years of life, she had only seen such mansions on TV. However, it was just a shock, and there was no happy expression on Skye's face. Perhaps she thought that she would be returned soon, just like a piece of goods that no one wanted. Eric didn't know what his adopted daughter was thinking. He excitedly took Skye around the villa and told her where the study was, where the entertainment room was, and where the dining room was. Look at this. This is the honor of our Lancher family. Oh, by the way, from now on, your last name will be Lancher. Sky Lancher. Eric's tone was very serious, and he said very carefully she passed on her surname, but Sky had no idea. She had already been attracted by what she saw in front of her. This is the largest living room in the villa, covering an area of over 300 square meters. Eric built a miniature maglev train line here. The rails are only a palm wide, but they extend throughout the entire living room. Sometimes they run straight, sometimes they circle up, sometimes they dive down, and finally they are linked together to form a closed ring that fills up the entire living room. On the railway track, a small train was speeding past, so fast that it was almost an afterimage. This is the Lancher family's contribution to the entire world, the maglev train. Eric walked to Sky and gently put his hand on her shoulder. This model is completely powered by solar energy. In theory, this car can last forever. Run non-stop for 70 years until the material completely ages. Can it seat people? This was the first thing Sky said after seeing Eric, which made Eric very happy. Sure enough, dealing with such a slightly autistic child attracted her attention, is the best way. I'm afraid not. It's too small and too fast. No one can sit on it safely. Eric squatted down and pointed at the speeding train, its speed can reach Mach 2 at its fastest. Faster than a bullet. Sky suddenly showed a disappointed expression. She didn't understand the concept of Mach 2. She only knew that this thing was just a decoration. She could only look at it but not touch it. Eric saw his adopted daughter's expression and said hurriedly, 
Sky, don't worry, we are already building two real maglev train lines, which will be open to traffic in more than three years. In the future, these lines will be built all over the United States and all over the world. If you build a train, the speed of airplane travel will be second. Sky pursed his lips and said nothing. Eric raised his eyebrows. It seemed that his adopted daughter had closed her heart very well. Okay, Sky, on the first day we meet, I want to give you a meeting gift. Tell me, what do you want most? Sky still ignored him and just stared at the speeding train in a daze. Eric frowned, this is not possible, there is no way to communicate at all. He forced Sky's shoulders and stared into her eyes, listen, Sky. I know what you want most. Sky's eyes widened when he heard this, obviously not believing his nonsense. You want to find your biological parents, right? Sky's eyes widened even more, revealing this infinite desire and fear. You don't have to be afraid. I won't blame you. No orphan would miss his parents. Eric stroked her forehead and tucked the hair behind her ears behind her ears. I know where your parents are. Eric's words rang in Sky's ears like a groundbreaking shock, making her tremble all over. She grabbed Eric's arm tightly with her two small hands, her lips trembled a few times, and she wanted to speak but did not say anything. I'm sorry, Sky, your parents are very special, so I can't tell you right now. All you need to know is that they are still alive. Eric stretched out a hand and picked up Sky, her little body seemed to have no energy, any weight. Well, how about we make an agreement? You are eight years old this year, and in ten years, when you become an adult, how about I tell you the news about your parents? Ten years. Sky raised her fist and almost hit Eric in the face. Hey. Girl, don't get excited. Even if I tell you now, what can you do? You can't do anything. You have to be an adult at least before you have enough strength to go find them. So, ten years, is there any problem? Ari Clark smiled and pressed Sky's little fist down. Okay. You must tell me when it's my 18th birthday. Sky's little eyes were full of expectation and determination. Of course, I keep my word. But there are conditions. Sky's body stiffened instantly. What? Conditions. Eric's lips couldn't help but curl up. How about this? You have to take the initiative to say 10 words to me every day for these 10 years. How about that? 10 sentences a day. Sky's eyes widened again. She never expected that Eric would make such a request. Of course, 10 sentences a day, 300 sentences a month. Even if I'm not here, this number has to be accumulated. It must be enough for 300 sentences every month, and you must take the initiative to say it to me, how about it? Eric his expression is like a fox. Sky clenched her fists tightly, tilted her head and stared at him. After looking at him for a long time, she finally let go of her hand weakly, okay, 10 sentences, 10 sentences. Eric suddenly laughed, carried Skye to a spacious bedroom on the second floor, and placed her on the princess bed, let's do this for today, have a good sleep, and we will buy you some clothes early tomorrow morning. And, you can just call me Eric, of course, if you are willing, I have no objection to calling me father. Okay, Skye hesitated, Eric. Eric smiled nonchalantly, turned around and closed the door for her. As soon as the door closed, Eric let out a long sigh of relief. He opened his right hand and a slender hair lay quietly in his hand, now, go and try it. When the villa was first built, Eric asked the engineers to design a nuclear defense project underground. This is a very common practice among American wealthy people. The entire nuclear defense project is as big as a football field and was transformed by Eric into a research and experiment center. The hundred or so hydro researchers he brought back from the Arctic are now hidden there. What is special is that this nuclear defense project has no entrance or exit. The only place that can be accessed is in Eric's study. The underground of this study room is made of steel plates up to two meters thick. Eric stood in the study room and gently raised his hand towards the ground. The steel plates suddenly seemed to melt and collapsed into a narrow passage. Ha ha ha, I have finally arranged a daughter for the protagonist. What a blessing it is to have a daughter. Well, I won't say any more. I'm going to make milk powder for my girl. Eric came to his laboratory, put the slender hair into the instrument that had been prepared, and detected it skillfully. The instrument started slowly, and Eric stared nervously at the computer screen. The entire set of instruments here was designed by him personally. 
He knew very well that it would take at least four or five hours to complete the entire test, but he didn't want to leave even half a step. Because this test result will be related to his future. One million years ago, a team of celestials came to Earth to conduct genetic experiments. At that time, early humans had already been born. Based on the variability of human genes, the celestials created two types of human descendants, the Eternals and the Abnormals. The celestial group implanted a sleeping DNA synthesis into the bodies of abnormal people. This synthesis will one day undergo benign mutations, allowing them to acquire a variety of powerful abilities. However, the evolutionary effect of the abnormal people was not ideal, so the celestial group destroyed the abnormal people. That attack directly caused the sinking of Atlantis. Some of the surviving abnormal people sank to the bottom of the sea with Atlantis. Became the ancestor of Neptune Namor. The other part of the survivors who stayed on land are the ancestors of mutants. Speaking of the Eternals, they can use the energy of the universe, are infinitely powerful, will not get tired, will not get sick, are immune to toxins, almost nothing can affect them, and are very powerful. Later, the Eternal Ones split into two groups due to a civil war, with one group staying on Earth and the other heading to Uranus. The Eternals who went to Uranus were defeated by the Kree and fled to Titan, the planet Titan, the hometown of Thanos. They are the ancestors of the Titan family. Later, the Kree came to Earth and discovered traces of the Celestial Group's experiments, so they experimented with the genes of Earthlings and Eternals, thus giving birth to the Inhumans. And Sky is a member of the Inhumans, the future famous destroyer of worlds, Shock Girl. Shock Girl, as the name suggests, Sky's ability is Shock, which is an extremely powerful ability. At a large scale, the vibrations can cause earthquakes, tsunamis and even tear apart the planet. At a small scale, the microscopic level of any substance is constantly vibrating. If Sky has enough strength, he can destroy or control any substance. According to string theory, everything in the world is produced by the vibration of strings. Whether it is matter or energy, existing or non-existent, they are all just ripples produced by the vibration of strings. Eric's ability is to create and control electromagnetic force, which is one of the four basic forces of the universe and one of the most basic rules in the universe. However, this ability is also a ripple produced by the vibration of strings. Sky's ability is closer to the essence of the universe than Eric's. Of course, these things are still too far away now, and Eric does not expect to control the nature of the universe through Sky's ability. He has not even fully developed his electromagnetic power and has only touched the tip of the iceberg. By controlling one of the four basic forces, Eric's future path has already been determined, which is to integrate the four basic forces and understand the unified field theory. In all the parallel universes of Marvel, the most powerful Magneto relied on his intelligence to understand the unified field theory, and he was so powerful that he could create a black hole with his bare hands. Eric believed that he did not have such a strong understanding. He knew that with his little wisdom, he could not even solve the problem of unifying the gravitational field and the electromagnetic field. Therefore, he needs some external help and appropriate off-field assistance, and Sky's vibration ability is the best assistance. As time passed, Sky's genetic map was gradually drawn, and test results were generated one by one. Eric stared at the dazzling data on the screen, calculating silently in his mind. After a while, he closed his eyes in disappointment and let out a long sigh. Sure enough, no. Her genes are not activated, and the test cannot yield any useful data. Alas. Eric had actually expected this result, but he still had fantasies and wanted to see if the instrument he designed could work. Detect what he wants without activating the gene. Unfortunately, Lady Luck is not on his side this time. The mutants, superpowers come from the X gene in the body. The X gene will automatically activate when certain conditions are met. However, the Inhumans are different. If they want to activate their genes, they must rely on the Terrigen mist created by Kree technology. Without Terrigen, the Inhumans can only live their lives like ordinary people. Hey, it's a long detour, and we're back to square one. Shield, in the end we still need to rely on Shield. Just wait, Sky is still young anyway, and can't bear the mutation of Terrigen Mist, I still have time, not urgent. The next day, just after dawn, Sky got up, ran to Eric's bedroom without even washing her face, and knocked on the door, 
Dong Dong Dong. Eric spent the night researching in the underground laboratory. He was woken up as soon as he lay down. He opened the door sleepily and saw the little lowly standing at the door with an expressionless face. Eric, good morning. Before Eric could say anything, the little girl greeted him first and then turned away, leaving Eric with a stunned look on his face. What's going on? Eric looked at Sky's leaving figure blankly, and vaguely heard a, first sentence. It's your own fault and you will not live. Eric couldn't laugh or cry. The little girl emotion was completing the ten-sentence task. Now that the mission has been completed, he, the NPC, can take off work temporarily. Eric patted his forehead and went back to bed to sleep. When he woke up again, it was already past nine in the morning. He came to the kitchen in his pajamas and just opened a bottle of coke for himself when he heard hurried footsteps behind him. Eric, good morning. Sky still had the look of completing the task. Eric shook his head speechlessly, Sky, if your ten sentences every day are all this kind of greeting, then our agreement can only be invalidated. Why? Sky was immediately anxious. The task of ten sentences is to make you integrate into this family, and even into society in the future. Sky, humans are social animals. If you only live in your own world, what is the meaning of living? Eric's words made Sky think, and Eric did not disturb her. For a while, the kitchen was extremely quiet. Gurgle gurgle. A strange sound suddenly sounded, and Sky's cheeks suddenly turned red. Eric looked at her belly with a surprised look. Eric, do we have anything to eat? Sky hurriedly said, holding her stomach, and then asked him carefully, does this count? Eric looked up at the sky speechlessly, rolled his eyes and blurted out one word, count. Then, he opened the refrigerator, trying to find something for Sky to eat, but found that there was only coke and beer in the refrigerator. Ah, uh, how do I usually eat? It seems that I always eat outside. It seems that I need to hire a nanny. Sky, what do you want to eat? Let's go out to eat. As a billionaire, Eric doesn't need to go to work on time every day. He has plenty of time to accompany his adopted daughter. He took Sky to a Michelin restaurant for a full meal, then went to the amusement park for a crazy play, and then went straight to the mall. Sky seemed very reserved. Although she was still very young, her special experience made her much more mature than ordinary children. She knew that she easily got a life that 99% of the people in the world could never get in their lifetime. In her heart, panic is far more than other emotions. Along the way, Sky was like a puppet, never expressing her own opinions, letting Eric manipulate him. He said to go wherever he went, and he didn't agree or disagree, which made Eric very troubled. Finally, when passing a computer city, Sky finally had some reaction. She stood at the door of the computer city, looking at the large posters on the wall, her eyes full of desire. Sky, do you want to make one? Eric pouted as he looked at the words on the poster. 8M high-speed operation, 340M large hard disk, support for 5.25 and 1.44 dual floppy drives. Can this thing be called a computer? It can even freeze when playing chess. Sky, do you want a computer? Eric squatted down and pushed her long hair behind her shoulders. Eric found that he liked Sky's hair very much. It was black and beautiful, soft in texture, and more comfortable to touch than petting a cat. Sky pursed her lips and looked at him with very eager eyes, Eric, I. Mr. Jones has a computer at home, I. Okay, I understand, since you like it, buy it. Eric picked up Sky and pushed the door into the computer city. He ignored the enthusiastic salesperson and went straight to the manager's office. I want to buy all the computers in your mall. In Sky's shocked eyes, Eric emptied the computer city directly, and a full 10 delivery trucks drove into his villa in a mighty manner. Thank you, Eric, but I really don't need so many. One is enough. Sky looked at the computers piled up in the villa and carefully pulled the corner of Eric's clothes. She thought it would be better for her not to show that she liked something in the future, otherwise, her adoptive father would go crazy again. Eric touched Sky's hair and narrowed his eyes, Sky, don't worry, we are not short of money, just buy whatever you want. Eric. Sky dodged his hand and stared at him with wide eyes. What's wrong? Oh, okay, okay, I know, I bought these useful ones and gave you one. I have other uses for the rest. You will know in a while. Eric chose the one with the best configuration and moved it back to Sky's bedroom. Okay, 
go and rest now. We will go buy you some clothes in the afternoon. Watching Sky fall asleep, Eric came to the pile of computers again and started his transformation work. In his opinion, since he has adopted Sky, he must fulfill his father's responsibility. As long as she wants, he will give her the best. The technological level of the earth is actually not as backward as it seems. Wakanda was able to hide itself hundreds of years ago, Howard designed the arc reactor decades ago, S.H.I.E.L.D. is building an aircraft carrier that flies in the air, Tony Stark's artificial intelligence has taken shape, even Eric, the equipment in his underground laboratory is at least 20 years more advanced than the ones on the market. But the technological products used by ordinary people are not satisfactory, just like a simple computer. Obviously, many forces can upgrade it dozens of generations in minutes, but no one takes action. People are selfish, let alone forces hidden in the dark. Eric wants to upgrade Sky's computer, but he can't be too advanced, so he can only choose to upgrade it with the parts of these computers. When Sky woke up from her nap, she was completely shocked. Next to her bedroom, there was originally a large study room with more than a dozen bookcases filled with various books, and a very large world map hanging on the wall. But now, the bookcase in the study has disappeared, replaced by a small desk that looks tailor-made for her height. Opposite the desk, there should have been a wall, but now it is full of computer screens. Yes, a whole wall of screens. Eric, what is this? Sky's voice trembled a little. I upgraded your computer for you, try it. Eric smiled and took out a small and cute pink keyboard. Sky noticed that this keyboard actually had no connection cable. A very simple wireless technology. Eric shrugged, pushed her to the desk, and asked her to sit down. Look, press here to turn on the computer. I upgraded your CPU and hard disk. And, I also upgraded the system program for you. Eric taught softly, and Sky was gradually attracted to it. She temporarily put aside her confusion and devoted herself to learning about computers. Lines of code appeared on the huge screen from time to time, and files were opened and closed. Leaving Sky to study her new toy, Eric left alone. He just received a call. After more than a year, the mole finally got news about Barton. This was very unexpected for Eric. He originally thought that Barton would be easy to find, but he didn't expect that the mole would take more than a year to find him. You can't blame me. At the Margaret sister's bar, the mole was innocent in response to Eric's questioning, I don't know who the guy offended, and he hid in a rich man's cellar for a year. If a friend didn't go there and accidentally fell in, we wouldn't be able to find him at all. Cell. Hiding for a year. Eric looked weird. What was going on? How could he force the future Hawkeye to this point? Where is he now? He ran away. Eyes shrugged and made a helpless expression, he's very skilled, my friend is no match for him, and was knocked unconscious. Eric rolled his eyes, then why did you call me here? Hey, my friend installed a tracker on him. Oh, tracker. Your friend actually carries this with him. Eric looked at him with a smile, and, he actually went to play near the rich man's cellar. Uh, he, that. The mole was incoherent and didn't know how to answer. Just check it out. Don't be so polite, Eric patted his shoulder, tell your friend to stay away from my house. I don't want him to fall into my cellar. Uh, okay, hee hee, okay. The mole nodded in agreement. Okay, give me Patton's position, and someone will send you the balance in a while. Overtime, overtime, overtime every day. Oh, Barton is such a good place picker. Eric was enjoying the beautiful scenery outside the car window, and he felt relaxed and happy. This is Tongass National Park, the largest national forest in the United States, which includes 19 nature reserves, Admiralty Islands National Monument Park, and Misty Fjords National Scenic Area. There is the Cotton Field Glacier and several other glaciers in the forest. Now is the beginning of spring, and many glaciers have melted slightly. The sound of trickling water under the ice can be heard from a long distance. The top of the mountain in the distance is still covered with snow, but there is a dark green pine sea on the hillside. From a distance, it looks like a green vegetable ball with a touch of salad dressing. To be honest, Eric really regretted not bringing Sky with him. It doesn't matter, I'll bring Sky to play again later. Eric set out from downtown Juno and drove along the auxiliary road at a leisurely pace, enjoying the beautiful scenery of the Cotton Field Glacier along the way 
feeling the magnificence of nature, and feeling relaxed. Following the upstream of the Miantianao Glacier, it soon reached the end of the auxiliary road. Further up, there was a dense primeval forest, which was an undeveloped area. Eric parked the car on the side of the road, took a long knife from the car and hung it on his waist, took out a full quiver and put it on his back, and walked into the primeval forest with a compound bow in his hand, like a hunter who came to poach. Going to see Hawkeye, you must bring a bow and arrow. Hawkeye has lived in a circus since he was a child. He learned superb swordsmanship from a swordsman, and later became a disciple of Jishemin and mastered first-class archery. He is talented and gifted. It didn't take long for him to surpass his teacher and easily defeated the two teachers. Meeting such a future subordinate for the first time, Eric must, convince him with force, and ravage him in the field he is best at. Walking and stopping along the way, making detours, Eric tried his best to avoid large animals. If he couldn't avoid them, he would scare them away with electromagnetic pulses. Walking under a big tree, Eric suddenly stopped. He tilted his head to look at the leaves on the ground, pulled out a long knife and gently poked it, revealing a hidden vine. This is a trap. Using local materials, the tools used are vines, branches and the like, which are not only extremely concealed, but also low carbon and environmentally friendly. This kid is really cautious. He started setting traps two kilometers away. Eric covered the leaves again, identified the direction and rushed all the way. There were more and more traps along the way, and Eric dodged them one by one without destroying any of them. Not long after, Eric came to the foot of a small hill. The mountain was made of rocks and had many cracks. The signal source of the tracker was in a crack that was one person wide. Eric glanced at the crack and ignored it. He stretched out his hand and pulled out a feather arrow, aimed at the top of a big tree, pulled the bow, full string, and let go, all in one go. The feather arrow turned into a stream of light and shot into the top of the tree. After making a muffled sound, it flew out from the other end of the tree top, flying a long way in the air and still going unabated. The real pattern is there. How could a small tracker be hidden from Hawkeye pattern? He had already discovered the tracker, but he just used it to set traps and lure the enemy into the trap. This is a common measurement used by hunters. Patton felt that he was a qualified hunter. He was very confident in the traps he set, and he believed that he could catch any prey. However, when the feather arrow flew past his scalp, he knew that the identities of hunter and prey had already been exchanged. Patton quickly got out of the tree canopy, climbed to the other side of the tree, blocked the enemy's sight with the trunk, and quickly descended by grabbing a vine. Eric sensed Patton's movements, the corners of his mouth curled up slightly, and he bent the bow again and put the arrow. Swish. This cut was also extremely fast, making a dark sound of breaking through the air in the air. Bang. With a muffled sound, the feather arrow hit the tree trunk, Patton's hair stood on end, and he used both hands to pull the tendons and vines to stop his falling momentum. Just as he stopped, he heard a slight sound, and a sharp arrow shot out from the tree trunk and stopped steadily under his crotch, less than an inch away from his vital parts. The sharp arrow cut Patton's pants, and the biting cold wind poured in from the gap, causing Patton's buttocks to shrink. He accidentally touched the arrow again, and the cold metal made him shiver. What kind of monster is this? Patton thought that his archery skills were already very superb, but the guy he was facing now was countless times more perverted than him. Also, what kind of bow and arrow is this? It can actually shoot through a tree that is several people hugging thick with one arrow. Ordinary sniper rifles can't do it. This person is invincible. Patton no longer hesitated, exerted force on his limbs, jumped down from the tree trunk, drew an arc in the air, and after landing, he turned over several times to eliminate inertia and ran wildly towards the depths of the forest. Eric sensed that Patton was going to run, and was speechless. He was still thinking about playing with Patton with two arrows, but he didn't expect this kid to be so scary. However, I can't let you fly away with the duck in hand. Eric reached behind his back again, pulled out five feather arrows, and aimed at the sky to draw a full circle. Patton ran all the way, changing direction or making a feint from time to time, and soon he had run several miles. He listened carefully behind him, and it seemed that there was nothing unusual, so he couldn't help but breathe a sigh of relief. But just when he was just relaxing, there were suddenly several sounds of breaking through the air above his head. 
Patton was shocked and stopped in a hurry. He saw five streams of light falling from the sky, straight at his feet, forming a pentagon and trapping himself in the center. The distance of each arrow was as if measured with a ruler, and it was exactly the same. Patton swallowed his saliva and stood in the center of the arrows, not daring to move. Eric sensed that Barton was no longer moving, smiled slightly, put away his bow and arrow, and walked towards him leisurely. For more than ten minutes, Barton was sweating profusely while waiting, while Eric walked easily. Clinton Francis Barton. Eric stood in front of Barton calmly. Who are you? Barton looked Eric up and down, and said hesitantly, Eric Lanchier. Oh. Do you know me? Eric was surprised. I've seen it on TV. Eric suddenly realized that he was a billionaire and a public figure after all. It was normal for him to be on TV, and it was not surprising for people to recognize him. What do you want from me? Barton asked cautiously. I need a bodyguard, and I think you are suitable. Eric smiled like Colson. Ah. Barton looked at the compound bow on Eric's back in surprise, do you still need a bodyguard? I don't need one, but my daughter does. Barton nodded in realization, and then asked hesitantly, are you really not here for that? If not, how did you find me? That thing. What is it? Eric raised his eyebrows, looking curious. He really wanted to know who forced Hawkeye Barton to hide. Hey, I heard that Jeremy Renner took drugs. What a pity, why would he touch that stuff instead of being a good actor? Uh, should we reduce Hawkeye's role? In the United States, if your friend or neighbor was fine one day and suddenly disappeared without a trace the next day, leaving no trace behind, then please don't panic, they just heard something they shouldn't have heard. Content, they saw things they shouldn't have seen, they will be fine, they were just taken away and shot for five minutes, just five minutes. This was the case for Patton, but he had the strength to escape on the way to being shot. The story started a year ago. At that time, he was still, cultivating in seclusion, at the circus, making money to save some money for his wife. The circus came to a certain coastal city to perform. One night, Barton went to the beach to practice archery as usual. According to him, it was a unique secret that Gia she taught him. Practicing it in the dark could enhance his eyesight. Then, he saw something he shouldn't have seen. A large group of people are hunting a mutant. According to Barton's understanding, that person should be a mutant. Barton has been working in the circus all year round and has been exposed to all kinds of religions. Barton is no stranger to mutants. He is so powerful that he can break a tree as thick as a thigh with a wave of his hand, he can control the water flow, and with a roar, a huge wave will rise from the sea and hit the enemy, and he can also fly. Barton saw him flying into the air and destroying several helicopters with the spear in his hand. More than 200 soldiers armed with various weapons fought with him for more than 10 minutes, but except for the loss of dozens of lives, there was no result at all. Oh. Is this person really that powerful? Was he caught later? Eric asked casually, squinting his eyes. He had already roughly guessed who the mutant was. Super physical fitness, water control, flying, spear weapons. Still on the beach, who else could be there besides Neptune Namor? He was caught. At this point, Barton patted his chest with lingering fear. Later, the group drove out two strange cars with a large disc on the roof. They put the disc on aimed at the mutant, and then made a very harsh sound, and the mutant was knocked unconscious directly. Quote. Eric's expression suddenly froze. This seems to be his fault again. The weapon Barton mentioned is 100% the sonic tank produced by himself. Then how were you discovered? Eric asked with concern, forcing his expression back to normal. Well, I was also unlucky. I was hiding it well, but the soldier controlling the disc sneezed, and when his hand shook, the weapon swept me away. At this point, Barton had a look on his face. Anger. It's really unjust that the gun was lying there. Later I found a way to escape, but they still pursued me. I was forced to have no choice but to hide. I hid for a year. How can you be sure they are soldiers? What characteristics do they have? Eric is now very concerned about the origins of that group of people. Could it be a military operation to obtain the sonic tank produced by Alice Industries? If that's the case, then Barton will be in trouble. They wear uniforms, are equipped with standard weapons, and their actions are organized. They must be soldiers. As for their characteristics, well, they have an eagle-shaped logo on their clothes. Eagle Eye is indeed an eagle eye. 
Even in the dark night, he still can see these small details clearly. Eagle logo, shield. Also, with the power of shield, it is really easy to get a few sonic tanks. But why does shield want to capture Namor? No, maybe it's not shield, but Hydra. Eric immediately thought of Alexander's disgusting face. Mr. Eric. Barton saw Eric lost in thought and called him softly. Oh, I'm sorry. Eric came back to his senses, suddenly stared at Barton and asked, why do you believe me so much? I only asked one question and you told everything. When Barton heard this, he smiled bitterly and pointed to the five feather arrows at his feet, I can't beat you. Taking Barton back to New York, Sky now has a driver, bodyguard, thug, fighting teacher, and mascot. As for Patton's trouble, now that he knows it was Alexander who caused it, it is no longer a trouble. Eric called Alexander's office and told him directly, Barton is my man, don't cause trouble for him again in the future. Then, Eric held off the phone without waiting for Alexander to reply, making Alexander furious. But in the end, he endured it. Barton was just an insignificant person, and there was no need to fall out with Eric because of him. At the same time, Alexander also thought about a deeper level. Is Barton the Eric's person before or now? If it was before, then why did Eric's men appear at the scene where he captured Aquaman? Could it be that Eric has been sending someone to monitor his actions? So, in addition to Barton, is there also an undercover agent sent by Eric around him? Is Eric already planning to seize his power? If it was just now, then why did Eric save Button? Is it for information about Neptune? Or to deal with yourself? Or is there some secret hidden in Barton? It has to be said that people in high positions think very fast. Less than a minute after the call was hung up, Alexander had already had a lot of thoughts popping up in his mind, and every one of them was well-founded and well-founded. All made him worried. Alexander has troubles, and so does Eric. Why was Neptune Namor, this grumpy guy, captured by Hydra? Will he be sectioned for study or tortured? To save him or not to save him? Eric touched his chin and thought carefully. It took him a long time to make up his mind. Save. Aquaman is the king of Atlantis. He has been missing for a year. Atlantis will definitely send people to look for him. If they find out that the surface people have captured their king, then a war is inevitable. Since we want to save him, we have to find out where he is. Eric directly contacted his undercover Garrett, but the answer he got was that he didn't know. Garrett didn't even know about the arrest of Namor, let alone the place of detention. In desperation, Ike had to ask Professor X, the world's strongest online search system, for help again. When Professor X heard that Namor was missing, he also realized the seriousness of the matter and put on the brain enhancement device without saying a word. Eric, your guess is right. Many Atlanteans have come to the shore. We need to rescue Namor as soon as possible. The world's strongest online search system is really not covered. It found Namor's location in minutes and passed the address to Eric. Eric frowned when he saw the address, I didn't expect it to be here. What a trouble. After more than a year, Eric once again set foot on the grasslands of Kenya. After unremitting efforts, Alice Industries has invested in and built a large number of raw material production and processing bases in Kenya. Steel, rare earths, niobium, barite. A steady stream of raw materials are shipped back to the United States at low prices and invested in the construction of maglev trains and other projects, saving a lot of money and time for Alice Industries. Eric came this time without notifying anyone. After getting off the plane, he went directly to Wakanda. This time, the black people from the Frontier tribe were extremely enthusiastic. The car was still far away and they sang African songs to welcome the distinguished guests. Eric drove the car directly into Wakanda amidst a burst of cheers. Eric, friend of Wakanda, welcome. At the Wakanda palace, King T'Chaka opened his arms and gave Eric a big hug. Eric smiled and patted T'Chaka on the back, long time no see, T'Chaka, look at your body, as strong as a leopard. Behind T'Chaka, followed two little boys with one side tall, little black panther T'Challa and little golden leopard Nijadaka. Nijadaka wore a robe that was very characteristic of Wakandan, while T'Challa wore a tailor-made black suit. It seems that T'Challa is like a little prince who came to Wakanda to visit, while Nijadaka is more like the future master of Wakanda. What does this mean? The waterfall duel is over. 
Nijadaka has seized power. How can it be? Ha ha, Eric, if you had come a little later, you wouldn't have seen T'Challa. He's going to study in England. T'Chaka answered Eric's doubts. I see. Hey, why don't you see Miss Aurora? Eric looked around twice and couldn't find the little storm girl. She's gone. The little black panther T'Challa looked a little depressed. During the solar storm a few days ago, Aurora said that she sensed someone controlling the solar storm. She also wanted to become that powerful, and then gone. Oh, that's it, haha. Ha. Eric smiled awkwardly, his feelings were his fault again. Eric, come with me in and take you to see my daughter. Oh, my god, she is really a gift from the leopard god Buster. Speaking of his daughter, T'Chaka suddenly showed happiness on his face. With a smile, the king's majesty had long been lost to Java. Look, another daughter controlled. T'Chaka, this matter is very serious. I need Wakanda's help. After visiting the queen and the little princess Shurui, Eric finally talked about the purpose of coming here. T'Chaka had already expected that Eric's special trip to Wakanda would be a big deal. He directly blocked the entire room, looking like he was all ears. Wakanda is in danger. Eric's first words made T'Chaka's eyelids jump. Give me a map of Kenya. T'Chaka took out a bead that was still on the ground. The bead immediately emitted a beam of light, forming a three-dimensional projection in the air. Kimo Yuju. Eric raised his eyebrows and looked at the projection, not bad. It is still three-dimensional, which saves a lot of drool. T'Chaka, look, this is Wakanda. Eric drew a circle on the projection to mark the location of Wakanda. Then, he moved his finger slightly upward, almost touching the border of Wakanda, and knocked twice hard there. An extremely dangerous person is being held here. This is impossible. T'Chaka looked in disbelief, thinking that Eric was joking with him. Eric, the whole of Africa is within Wakanda's sight. As long as you enter the African continent, no one can hide it. Get past Wakanda's sight. What if we send people here directly without passing through the African continent? Eric stared closely into T'Chaka's eyes with a very serious expression. T'Chaka was stunned when he was asked, and it took him a long time to ask with a look of disbelief on his face, is it possible that a country in the world has already developed teleportation technology? Eric rolled his eyes and really wanted to tell him that Kamataj has mastered this technology for thousands of years. It's not teleportation, it's the bottom of the sea. Eric put his hands together and zoomed out the map so that he could see the Atlantic and Indian Oceans. He found a random point on the Atlantic coastline and drew a straight line toward Wakanda. Someone entered from the Atlantic Ocean, traveled directly through the ocean at the bottom of the African plate, and established a secret base under Wakanda. Eric's words made T'Chaka's eyes widen. He stared at the map for a long time and shook his head solemnly, this is impossible. Even with Wakanda's technology, it is difficult to do it. How can those countries outside is it possible to have such advanced technology? What if we don't rely on technology? Eric said quietly. If you don't rely on technology, what's the use? T'Chaka looked at Eric in confusion, only to find that he had taken out a coin and played with it on his fingertips. The coin kept jumping between Eric's, occasionally flying into the air, and then being caught steadily after falling. T'Chaka believed that even the best magician in the world might not be able to do it. Eric is so perfect. The next scene made T'Chaka's eyes widen. Eric slowly put his hand down and put it behind his back, but the coin was still doing the same action, even faster than before, and sensitive. This is. I'm sorry, T'Chaka, I'm a mutant. Eric bowed deeply to T'Chaka, you know, the outside world is very unfriendly to mutants, so I chose to hide it. I deeply apologize for this. It doesn't matter, my friend, Wakanda doesn't care whether its friends are mutants or not. T'Chaka hurriedly stated his position, and asked solemnly, you mean, the prison below was set up by mutants? No, it was another group of people. They captured a special mutant, the king of Atlantis, Namor. Atlantis. T'Chaka frowned and thought. Wakanda had records about Atlantis, and he had read some of them, but the two countries were one on the African continent and the other on the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. There was almost no intersection, and the information was very scarce. He really couldn't remember much for a while. Aquaman Namor is also a mutant. His ability is very powerful. He can control seawater and even create earthquakes on the seabed. 
Undersea earthquake. Tachaka was awakened immediately. What does Wakanda care about most? Of course it's vibranium. Wakanda's protection of vibranium has almost reached the level of a copper wall and iron wall. Whether in the sky or underground, Wakanda's super black technology is protecting it. However, creating earthquakes from the deep sea under the continental plate. Tachaka was shocked. This is to rob the landlord's rice. Eric, what do you say? Wakanda will help you with all its strength. What to do? What else can we do? Go underground and rescue Aquaman. Eric was about to say it when he saw the strong murderous intent in Tachaka's eyes. Ha! Is he planning to kill Namor directly? Come to think of it, saving people is not as easy as killing people. Moreover, Namor's ability is completely the mortal enemy of Wakanda. Why save him? Can we save him and wait for other forces to catch him, and then give Wakanda another shot? He is a king. A monarch who killed his own brother. T'Chaka, I must remind you that Namor is the king of Atlantis. The power of Atlantis is not worse than Wakanda. Hearing Eric's words, the murderous intent in T'Chaka's eyes finally subsided a little, but it was obvious that he still hadn't given up this plan. Eric shook his head and said nothing more, but he had made up his mind in his heart that he must be careful and not let him kill Aquaman. T'Chaka, I need vibranium, lots of it. With T'Chaka's help, Eric's front was soon filled with vibranium. He looked at these lovely metals emitting a faint blue light, and his supernatural powers were already stirring. T'Chaka, before we start, I have to say something to you, Eric suppressed the restlessness of his supernatural powers and looked at T'Chaka very sincerely. I, Eric Lanchier, will always be a friend of Wakanda. T'Chaka was stunned, and immediately smiled and said, Of course, Eric, Wakanda will always be your friend. Eric nodded, looked at him deeply, and slowly raised his hands. In T'Chaka's shocked eyes, the piles of vibranium in front of them slowly floated up, then quickly melted in the air and merged into a huge vibranium ball. Then, Eric kneaded it in the air like plasticine, and the vibranium ball stretched and thickened at a speed visible to the naked eye, and finally formed a shuttle-shaped object like a spaceship. At this time, the intimacy in T'Chaka's eyes had long disappeared, and there was only fear and gloom. Eric saw his change and couldn't help sighing. Who can he blame? He can only blame his superpowers for being too strong. Magneto. T'Chaka suddenly asked softly. Eric was stunned, then shook his head. Our abilities are very similar, but they are a little different, and I am stronger than him. T'Chaka fell silent again, not knowing what he was thinking. Eric waved his hand, and the vibranium spaceship that had just been built floated over, opened a gap, and he jumped in first, then looked at T'Chaka. T'Chaka looked at Eric on the spaceship with mixed feelings. He felt that this day was the most tiring day since he came to this world. Two consecutive existences that could easily subvert Wakanda made him exhausted. No, maybe three. Magneto in Europe should be able to do it too. T'Chaka, aren't you coming? Eric couldn't help but shout when he saw that he hadn't moved for a long time. T'Chaka was startled, and quickly restrained his emotions, put on the Black Panther helmet, and jumped onto the spaceship nimbly. The interior of the spaceship was very simple. There was a small bulge on the top of the head, and electric sparks kept flashing on it, illuminating the interior. There were two seats transformed by vibranium on the ground. Apart from that, there was nothing else. T'Chaka, sit tight, we're going to set off. Eric controlled the vibranium spaceship with excitement on his face. This was a real big deal. He believed that the Magnetos in other parallel universes must not have done this. He was going to drill a hole in the African land. How high is the sky? How thick is the earth? No one could tell clearly before, but Eric now has a rough estimate that the earth is about 100 miles thick. Of course, this is the thickness of the African continental plate. Further down, there is the ocean and 1,800 miles of mantle. 100 miles, which only takes about an hour on the ground, is a little farther than the distance from the surface to the edge of space. Eric controlled the vibranium spaceship, transformed into a huge drill, and drilled straight down. There were no windows on the drill, so T'Chaka couldn't see the situation outside. He could only hear bursts of harsh roars. He simply knocked on the Black Panther helmet twice, turned on the sound insulation system, and closed his eyes to rest. The energy absorption effect of vibranium is indeed very strong. The two of them could not feel the temperature change at all in the drill, 
but Eric knew that as they drilled deeper and deeper, the temperature around them was also rising. After drilling for more than three hours, the vibranium spaceship suddenly trembled, T'Chaka suddenly opened his eyes, jumped up, and looked around vigilantly. We're there. Eric was delighted, waved his hand to open the spaceship, jumped out, and T'Chaka followed closely and jumped out. Is this the base? Of course, we are standing at the top of the base. Eric closed his eyes and sensed it, a smile appeared on his face, he raised his foot and stepped hard, making a loud, bang, sound, they wrapped themselves in an iron shell, interesting. Yes, it's very interesting. If it weren't for Namor's life, Eric could turn this base into a pile of scrap metal with just a slight pinch. Let's go. Eric opened a hole in the iron shell and jumped in. This base is very small. It is not easy for Hydra to transport supplies to this place. As soon as Eric and T'Chaka jumped into the base, they met Hydra soldiers. T'Chaka didn't even need to do anything. Eric just waved his hand lightly, and several pieces of broken iron sheets appeared on the wall, leaving several Hydras with their heads and bodies separated. As they moved forward, more and more Hydra soldiers appeared. Eric stopped at the right time to let T'Chaka vent his depression. Soon, the two of them cleared a path leading directly to the place where Namor was imprisoned. The two heard Namor's roar from afar, ran all the way, and soon arrived at the place. Eric waved his hand to open the iron door, and saw that Namor was locked in a metal box at the moment, with only his head and arms exposed. Several hydras in white coats were injecting him with some kind of medicine, while Namor, with red eyes, roared hysterically, and looked like he had lost much reason. Eric hurriedly took action and stopped several hydras, but unfortunately, there were already a pile of potion bottles on the ground, and Namor seemed to have been injected with a lot of potions. What is this? T'Chaka picked up the syringe on the ground, put it under his nose and smelled it, and immediately turned his head away. With a look of disgust, it's disgusting. Can this thing be used for injection? Eric ignored him, put his hand on Namor's head, and carefully released electromagnetic pulses to wake Namor up. Roar. Eric's electromagnetic pulse did not work, but made Namor even crazier. He roared at Eric and shook the metal cabinet that locked him violently. T'Chaka stood behind Eric. He looked at Eric who was busy there, stretched out his hand and knocked on the Black Panther uniform. The uniform on his arm suddenly deformed and turned into a blue laser gun, quietly aiming at Namor. I advise you not to do this. Sensing T'Chaka's movement, Eric turned his head and his face became a little cold. This was obviously a slap in his face. T'Chaka's movements couldn't help but froze, and he seemed to feel a little embarrassed, and slowly put down the laser gun. Eric glanced at him with some disappointment, turned his head to study Namor's situation, but as soon as he turned his head, T'Chaka suddenly raised his arm, aimed at Namor's head and shot. T'Chaka. What are you going to do? Eric controlled T'Chaka's vibranium suit in time. His shot did not hit Namor's head, but only shot a bullet on the metal box where Namor was imprisoned. Deep pits. Eric, I'm sorry, but Namor must die. T'Chaka tried to move, and found that he was trapped in the Black Panther suit and could not move, but he was not going to give in. Eric suddenly became angry, T'Chaka, wake up, it's best for Wakanda that Namor is alive. No. As long as he is alive, he is a threat. T'Chaka's attitude was very tough. If you kill him, Atlantis will go to war with Wakanda. As long as no one knows, nothing will happen. T'Chaka struggled and yelled loudly in the Black Panther suit. It's going to be okay. You thought the same thing when you killed Nizuab, but now... Almost the whole of Wakanda knows about it. Eric felt very headache about T'Chaka's thoughts. Why did he always are there some people who like to be smart and think no one will find out if they do bad things? It's different this time. He doesn't know how to write a diary. Eric, there are only two of us here, as long as. As long as what? As long as you kill me, no one will know, right? Eric interrupted T'Chaka. His face became colder. He aimed at T'Chaka spread his fingers, and T'Chaka was immediately the Black Panther uniform flew into the air, its limbs were spread out in a large shape, and the bones were cracked to the ground. No, no, Eric, we are friends. T'Chaka endured the pain and tried to argue. Friend, if you really think of me as a friend, just listen to my advice and don't take action against Namor again. Eric's words silenced T'Chaka. After a while, he said quietly, 
I'm sorry, Eric, I am the king of Wakanda, and I must be responsible for my people. As he spoke, a strange ripple suddenly erupted from T'Chaka's body, causing Eric to temporarily lose control of the Black Panther suit. T'Chaka fell down, knelt on one knee, stared at Eric, and stretched out the vibranium leopard claw in his hand, Namo, I'm going to kill him. Eric stopped talking nonsense and tried to control him again, only to find that his powers no longer worked on the vibranium suit. Wakanda's black technology. T'Chaka saw Eric's movement, jumped up, changed his right hand into a fist in the air, and hit Eric's shoulder hard. Successive kings of Wakanda will use the heart-shaped grass to strengthen their bodies. Their speed, strength, endurance, etc. are far beyond ordinary people. Coupled with the vibranium suit and invulnerability, ordinary people are no match for them. As long as he enters a fighting state, T'Chaka is no longer a king, but a warrior. As long as he takes action, he will show no mercy. Even an elephant might not be able to withstand the punch to Eric. T'Chaka also thought of the friendship between the two, so he did not hit the vital parts, but aimed at the shoulder. According to his estimation, this punch was enough to knock him down. Unfortunately, even without his powers, Eric still has a physique at least five times that of Captain America. When he saw the approaching punch, he stretched out his hand to catch it. Bang! With a muffled sound, T'Chaka's fist was firmly grasped by Eric, and his body did not move at all. You! T'Chaka was so shocked that he couldn't express it. He wanted to take his hand out, but found that Eric's hand was as solid as a rock and he couldn't pull it out no matter what. T'Chaka, give up. Even if you don't use your powers, you are no match for me. Eric stood there steadily, calm and collected. Black Panther never says give up. T'Chaka jumped up on the spot, spun around in the air, and twisted his arm. Eric couldn't hold it anymore and had to let go. Aren't you afraid of slipping your waist at such an old age? He complained, and Eric was not slow in his hands. He started from his waist with his right hand, as fast as lightning, and hit T'Chaka's waist hard. There was a muffled sound, and a blue light appeared on the Black Panther suit. That was kinetic energy stored between the chemical bonds of vibranium. T'Chaka took a punch from Eric, but was not injured at all. He jumped high and jumped over Eric's head. The sharp vibranium leopard claws streaked behind him, forcing Eric back, followed by a punch Namor in the head. Come back. Eric yelled, suddenly took a step forward, reached out and grabbed T'Chaka's leg, and pulled him back. The T'Chaka flexed his waist in midair, and the leopard claw struck Eric's arm again, forcing him to let go. After missing a hit, T'Chaka didn't give up and pounced on Namor again. It looked like he was determined to kill Namor. Eric couldn't let him succeed. He raised his hand slightly, and the metal box containing Namor flew up, barely avoiding T'Chaka's attack. T'Chaka, stop, this is pointless. Eric moved Namor behind him and urged him again. T'Chaka didn't reply, and bullied him again. This time, he put away the leopard's claws, and only used his fists. Each punch was heavier than the last, and each punch was faster than the last. He greeted Eric's chest with his fists. Eric countered every move, dodging and fighting back. He knew that with the protection of vibranium, T'Chaka would not be hurt, so he did not hold back and punched with every punch, as heavy as a mountain. After being punched several times in a row, T'Chaka suddenly rushed forward and rushed into Eric's arms, crossing his hands on his chest. Eric immediately realized what he was going to do, and quickly turned on the magnetic shield, knocking T'Chaka aside. It was also at this time that T'Chaka suddenly swung his arms down, and a blue shock wave exploded with him as the center. Eric stood in the magnetic shield, and the shock wave had no effect on him at all. Namor was not so lucky. He was directly hit far away by the shock wave and hit the wall hard, causing him to roar in anger again. T'Chaka. Eric was really angry this time. He waved his hands fiercely, and countless steel bars suddenly jumped out from the walls and floors around T'Chaka, and quickly jumped to his limbs, trying to tie him up. T'Chaka jumped up in a hurry, waving his vibranium leopard claws repeatedly, cutting off all the steel bars coming towards him. Due to Eric's destruction, the solid walls and ground were structurally destroyed and no longer solid. The huge pressure on the seabed immediately deformed these weak points, and soon streams of seawater leaked in. Soon, the base was knee-deep in water. Eric and T'Chaka were still fighting back and forth, 
but they didn't notice that Namor, who was lying on the wall, showed a smile of enjoyment on his face after touching the sea water, and then his eyes were fierce, and he shouted fiercely, and actually cracked all the metal boxes. Oops! Eric exclaimed, waving his hand in the direction of Namor, trying to trap him again with a metal box, but unfortunately, a ball of sea water turned into a giant hand, blocking the metal box one meter away from Namor, and he couldn't move forward. Tachaka also found something wrong and rushed towards Namor, but was controlled by Namor to rush far away with the sea water. Eric once again controlled a large amount of metal to surround Namor, but he blocked it back with sea water. Eric refused to give up, and fired several electromagnetic cannons, but they were like mud sinking into the sea, without any effect. The two were about to attack again, but Namor got impatient, roared violently, and smashed a leaking place on the wall, swimming towards the depths of the sea. Come back to me, Eric shouted, and countless metals swept away, turning into a chain wrapped around Namor's waist, trying to pull him back. Tachaka suddenly jumped up, and climbed up the chain nimbly against the backflow of seawater, and grabbed Namor's leg in the blink of an eye. Being in the sea, Namor seemed to have infinite power. He easily broke the chain around his waist, punched T'Chaka down again, and then controlled the seawater to turn into a giant hand, holding T'Chaka in the palm of his hand, and crushed him hard, trying to crush him to death. At this time, the seawater in the base was already as deep as the eyebrows. Eric turned on the magnetic shield, pushed the seawater away, and stomped his feet into the ocean. He controlled the metal again, turned it into an iron fist, and hit Namor's back hard, making him stagger. The seawater could not be controlled, and T'Chaka took the opportunity to run out. T'Chaka knocked on the Black Panther armor a few times, and a layer of blue light suddenly lit up on the helmet, isolating the seawater outside, and then swam towards Namor again. Namor stopped and floated in the sea, his long hair flying, his eyes glowing red, and he opened his mouth to roar angrily. It was strange that Eric and T'Chaka could still hear his roar. Eric controlled the metal and wanted to get close to Namor again, but found that the sea water around Namor was rotating at high speed. As soon as the metal got close to Namor, it would be crushed by the sea water and could not get close to him at all. T'Chaka swam to Eric, tapped his chest twice, and pointed at Namor. Eric understood and used his superpowers on the Black Panther suit. Only then did he find that he had regained control of the Black Panther suit. It seemed that T'Chaka had turned off the black technology that interfered with the magnetic field. Eric controlled the Black Panther suit and shot T'Chaka at Namor like a cannonball. The high-speed rotating sea water could not hurt the vibranium, but instead stored a lot of kinetic energy for the Black Panther suit, making T'Chaka look blue all over. T'Chaka passed through Namor's seawater shield and fought with Namor again. Eric had time to summon their vibranium spaceship. The vibranium spaceship came from far to near, and it kept changing shape on the way. Soon it became a square metal box, which covered Namor and T'Chaka. When Namor saw the box, he might have remembered his, snail house, life for a year. The anger on his face became heavier. He kicked T'Chaka away and quickly went upstream. Eric couldn't let him run away. He controlled the vibranium box and T'Chaka at the same time, followed closely, and went upstream behind Namor. Not long after, rocks appeared above the heads of the three people, blocking Namor's way like a sky curtain. That was the bottom of the African continental plate. Eric saw such a good opportunity, how could he give up, and controlled the vibranium boxes to scatter, sealing all the directions of Namor, wrapping him up and. T'Chaka was also thrown over by Eric to harass Namor and prevent him from escaping with any strange moves. Namor looked at the vibranium box getting closer and closer, and roared continuously. The sea water rioted in front of him, trying to wash the box away, but found that it was useless. Seeing that the space around him was getting smaller and smaller, Namor suddenly looked up and punched the rocky sky. A large amount of gravel fell, and countless small sand and gravel were stirred up and mixed in the sea water. The sea water suddenly became chaotic and it was difficult to see Namor's figure. Relying on magnetic field induction, Eric knew that Namor controlled the sea water to open a gap in the rock and drilled in. He hurriedly controlled the vibranium to deform again, turned into a drill and drilled in. After chasing for hundreds of meters, Namor's speed suddenly increased. He did break through the rock and entered a dark river. 
Eric and the others had just entered the dark river, and he had already swam several miles upstream. The vibranium drill deformed again, forming a streamlined hull, carrying Eric and the others to chase quickly. In the water, Namor's speed is faster than that of ordinary submarines. The maze-like underground river can't slow him down at all. Instead, it provides him with natural obstacles to block Eric's pursuit. At first, Eric carefully avoided boulders and other objects, but he soon found that this would only make Namor run farther and farther, so he no longer hesitated and drove the vibranium hull all the way, chasing Namor straight. Namor was in front, Eric and T'Chaka were behind, and the three of them followed the underground river all the way up, chasing for three or four hours, and then suddenly broke through a layer of rocks and entered a clear lake. Lake Turkana, the three returned to the surface. Namor fled all the way, and suddenly rushed out of the lake at this time, letting out a shocking roar. The Turkana lake under his feet seemed to be alive, gathering towards him and holding him up high. Eric and T'Chaka followed closely behind, flying out of the lake. The vibranium hull turned into a floating platform, carrying the two of them to the opposite side of Namor to confront him. T'Chaka took off his helmet, his dark face was covered with sweat. He wiped the sweat off his face and took out a Kimayu bead. Soon, his bald guard captain appeared on it. Mobilize the fighters. There are enemies in Wakanda. Eric looked at him silently without saying anything. Soon, Wakanda's fighters arrived. Hundreds of sci-fi fighters surrounded Namor. The blue light on the gun barrels flashed, ready to fire at any time. Namor stood on the water, looked up, his scarlet eyes flashed fiercely, and he roared a few times with his mouth wide open. The Turkana lake under his feet suddenly rose to the sky. Wakanda fighters opened fire at the same time. The place where Namor was submerged by countless blue lights was hit. The lake water was evaporated continuously, and a white mist rose. Stop. T'Chaka gave an order, and the fighters stopped attacking. The lake water slowly returned to calm, and the white mist gradually dissipated. Namor had already disappeared. Start scanning, find his body. The fighter plane cast blue light and scanned the lake back and forth, and Eric also silently sensed Namor's situation. The more he sensed, the deeper Eric frowned, and Namor disappeared. The sensing range continued to expand, and it had gradually touched the edge of Wakanda, and then found Namor's figure, he was unharmed. Oh no, Wakanda. What? What happened to Wakanda? Hearing Eric's shout, T'Chaka looked at him in confusion. Before Eric could answer, news came from Wakanda, Your Majesty, there is a flood in Wakanda. Flood. How is it possible? T'Chaka thought he had heard it wrong, but he reacted immediately and his face changed immediately, Namor. Go back. When everyone returned to Wakanda, the flood was already 15 or 16 meters high, as if there was a pair of invisible giant hands embracing it. The flood was firmly controlled outside the energy shield of Wakanda and did not flow to the surrounding grasslands. It was not that Namor wanted to protect the environment, but that this would make the water level higher. The frontier tribe had already retreated into the energy shield. The energy shield blocked the ravages of the flood, but destroyed the frontier tribe's station completely. Namor was held in the air by a column of water, as if a monarch was admiring the tortured enemy. Namor, you deserve to die. T'Chaka stood on the top of a fighter plane and saw this scene, and his eyes were immediately broken. Namor also saw the returning Wakanda fighters, grinned, and quickly descended into the water, disappearing. Search. T'Chaka roared, ordering all the fighters to disperse and search. He and Eric entered from above and returned to the palace. As soon as he entered the palace, Eric saw the queen holding the little princess Shuri, followed by two little princes, standing in front of the window, looking at the flood outside with worry. Amanda. T'Chaka took a few steps forward and hugged his wife tightly. T'Chaka, what's going on? The queen grabbed her husband's arm and asked nervously. T'Chaka opened his mouth, but didn't know where to start. He turned his head to look at Eric, but found that Eric had already turned his head away, and couldn't help but sigh deeply. Your Majesty, our energy shield can't hold up. A bald guard suddenly ran over and knelt on one knee. What? How is it possible? T'Chaka was full of disbelief. Our shield can reach the missiles, how can it not even stop a small flood? Because the missiles can only attack a very small range, while the flood is a full-scale attack on the shield. 
The eldest princess of Wakanda came over, still holding a tablet. These floods are moving non-stop, attacking our shields at every moment, every point, and our energy is being consumed at a very fast rate. It won't be long before it can't keep up with the demand, and then Wakanda will be flooded. How much time do we have? Eric asked hurriedly. Less than five minutes. The words of the eldest princess made T'Chaka fall into despair. He never thought that just because of his small decision, he would bring a devastating disaster to his country and his people. Outside the window, the people of Wakanda were still curiously looking at the flood outside the energy shield. They were very confident in Wakanda's energy shield and believed that it could block any attack, but they didn't know that the disaster was about to come. The flood was already 40 or 50 meters high. At this time, Wakanda was like a bowl turned upside down in the water. The flood had risen to about a quarter of the bowl. Where is the main hub of the energy shield? Take me there. Eric didn't care about etiquette at this time, and grabbed the princess's arm and flew up. The princess was panicked at first, but then recovered immediately and helped Eric to point the way. Hurry up and find Namor, don't kill him. Before flying away, Eric told T'Chaka, not knowing whether he would listen, and flew away with the princess. The energy shield is one of the most important defenses of Wakanda, and the protection of the main hub is naturally the top priority. With the princess leading the way, Eric flew all the way and soon went deep underground to the vibranium vein. This was the first time Eric came here. Although he had already sensed the situation here through the magnetic field, he was still shocked to see it with his own eyes. Looking around, a huge space had been dug out of the entire underground, and the soil layer on the opposite side could not be seen at a glance. On one side of the space is the smelting base established by Wakanda, which specializes in refining vibranium. Countless raw vibranium ores were sent here by train and then smelted into high-purity vibranium here. On the other side, there was the famous meteorite. Eric stared at it blankly, his supernatural powers stirring. This meteorite was unknown how big it was. Many huge mines were dug out on the front, and many trains drove in around it. Obviously, there were also mineral veins being excavated inside. The blue light illuminated the entire underground world, filling the surroundings with a mysterious atmosphere. The main hub is there. The princess had long been accustomed to the underground scene, and pointed the way to Eric seriously and responsibly. Eric looked in the direction of her finger, and there, it was actually at the bottom of the vibranium meteorite. The two of them descended quickly, and with the princess there, Eric entered the main hub smoothly. The area inside was not large, only a few hundred square meters, and more than half of it was occupied by the guards outside. The place that actually controlled the energy shield was less than 100 square meters, which was about the same as an ordinary family's house. There were only two devices in the whole room, one was placed by the wall, and it looked like a vibranium technology computer. The screen flashed Wakanda text and various data, which was dazzling. In the middle of the room, there is a circular platform with a diameter of more than 2 meters. On the platform, a translucent bowl is upside down, and the surroundings of the bowl are marked with red floods. This. Eric pointed at the round platform and looked at the princess. After getting the princess's affirmation, he walked forward and put his hand on the platform. The magnetic field induction spread along the platform, and soon all the secrets were presented in front of him. Under the basement of this room, there is a more complex and larger device, which is the core hub for controlling the energy shield. The one on the ground is just a keyboard and display. I need to use some vibranium, I hope you don't mind. Eric slowly sat down cross-legged, with his hands still on the platform. The superpowers gushed out through the platform, and soon covered the entire control hub, and then spread along the line to the whole of Wakanda. Everything in Wakanda is in sight. The flood has risen to a height of 100 meters. The people of Wakanda have long put down their work and looked up at the flood that covered the sky. The mood of fear quietly spread among the crowd. On the energy shield, the blue light in many places is slowly fading, and it is about to run out of energy. The energy shield can't hold. Someone shouted, and countless eyes looked in the direction of the sound. Suddenly, a big hole appeared on the energy shield that was originally as solid as a rock. The flood poured down like a cannonball. Then, there was the second hole, the third, the fourth, and the countless. In the blink of an eye, the energy shield collapsed completely. 
Let me tell you, the plot of flooding Wakanda is the Phoenix Five Apostles incident in the comics. This plot may also appear in Black Panther 3 in the future, but the specific reason is unknown, but there is a similarity, that is, Aquaman, so I borrowed the incident, but the plot, time, and reason are different from the original. The flood was overwhelming. Wakanda had technology far superior to the outside world, but it had no way to deal with the flood. Houses were destroyed. Trees were submerged, and countless Wakanda people were swept into the flood, screaming and crying. Bast, the leopard god, what have I done? T'Chaka knelt down in regret, looking at his people in the flood with tears. T'Chaka, find a way to save them. The queen also had a face full of grief, pulling her husband's battle clothes, begging. Fighter planes. Transport planes. All those that can fly are dispatched. Also need ships, all dispatched, and save as many as you can. Before T'Chaka could speak, the little golden leopard Nijadaka behind him suddenly gave an order to the female guard captain, which surprised everyone. Do as he says. T'Chaka shouted, and the female guard captain hurried to convey the order. Soon, countless aircraft and ships began to run under the flood and began a tense rescue. The flood was still pouring in, and the water level was rising. Every moment, Wakanda people fell into the flood. No matter how fast the aircraft and ships were, they could not save everyone. Many people could only watch their families and friends being swept away by the flood and disappeared. Everyone's face was wet, but they could no longer tell whether it was the flood or the tears. They could only do their best to save themselves and the people around them. People kept falling into the water and being washed away, and the wailing sounded throughout Wakanda. Countless people begged the gods they believed in, but they did not get any response. The leopard god Bast, who had rescued Wakanda from danger many times, did not show up this time. Wakanda fell into despair. At this time, countless items suddenly floated up under the water that people had never noticed. These things were the most commonly used things in their daily lives, pots and pans, adzes, chisels, axes and saws, and even spoons and buttons. As long as they were metal, they all floated up. These things deformed and merged in the water, turning into a large net covering the entire Wakanda, and slowly floated up. The flood flowed through the mesh, but the people were caught by the big net, slowly rising up, and soon they emerged from the water. The people who were about to drown suddenly breathed in fresh air, opened their mouths and gasped for air. The people who had already drowned fell on the big net, and those who could still stand up ran over to rescue them. T'Chaka, look, the leopard god Bast has appeared. The queen saw the scene outside and cried with joy, shaking her husband's arm to let him look outside. T'Chaka hurriedly raised his head and saw the huge metal net floating above the flood. With a complicated expression, he muttered to himself, it's not Bast, it's Eric. Dot dot dot. After rescuing the people of Wakanda, Eric breathed a sigh of relief and looked at the energy shield again. The original energy shield is pure energy, which has obvious advantages, strong protection and easy maintenance, but it also consumes a lot of energy. General attacks are okay, as long as a certain amount of energy is consumed, the attack can be offset, but when encountering intensive attacks, the energy consumption will rise sharply. This time, when faced with Namor's flood, almost every water molecule was attacking the energy shield. This density was countless times stronger than Thanos's vanguard core. The final outcome was the tragic defeat of the energy shield. Eric planned to strengthen it into something similar to his magnetic field shield. First, Eric extracted a large amount of energy to replenish his consumption of using superpowers to save people just now. Then, countless tiny metal particles flew out of the vibranium veins, gathered together in the air, and formed a gorgeous long river of blue light. The long river of vibranium flew out of the underground mine and spread in all directions. On the metal net, the people of Wakanda went through the initial fear and the joy of being saved. At this moment, they were sitting on the net and thanking their gods. Suddenly, they found that long rivers of blue light appeared above their heads. These long rivers were like giant dragons, moving in the air, baring their teeth and claws, and soon flew to the original energy shield and scattered. Tiny vibranium particles were arranged in special positions, and special magnetic fields connected the vibranium particles, and then connected them into a hole, forming a huge magnetic shield covering Wakanda, replacing the original energy shield. Next, turn on the energy shield again. 
Eric injected all the remaining energy into the energy shield, and the thin shield rose again, like a candle standing in the wind, which could be extinguished at any time. Taking advantage of this time, the magnetic shield covered the energy shield. Energy and vibranium were organically combined under the action of the magnetic field to form a stronger defense. The flood was blocked outside the shield again. Although Wakanda was already a vast ocean inside, the flood from the outside world no longer poured in. With survival guaranteed, the exasperated people of Wakanda began to come out in droves, and countless fighters and ships set off to find the traces of the culprit Namor. Eric's thoughts covered the entire Wakanda through the central system, and he knew every inch of Wakanda. However, there was no trace of Namor. He could not help but expand his sensing range far beyond the borders of Wakanda, and finally found Namor at the bottom of a river. How to catch him? Of course, don't shoot, just work quietly. Strands of fine vibranium powder flowed upstream along the river, and when they approached Namor, they all drilled into the soil and quietly sneaked to Namor's feet. Go. Eric, who was far away in the Wakanda control hub, stretched out his hand and clenched it hard. The vibranium particles under Namor's feet suddenly rose up, combined into a vibranium armor in the air, and put it on Namor. Namor didn't expect the attack to come from under his feet. He was still trying his best to control the flood, but in the blink of an eye, he had a very ugly metal armor on his body. He was shocked and angry, and tried to tear it off with both arms. Unfortunately, vibranium is so easy to be torn. Eric controlled the vibranium armor to shrink, and Namor lost control of the flood in great pain. At the border of Wakanda, the flood that was originally wrapped around the shield fell down in an instant, flowing in all directions, and turned into the sweetest supply for vegetation. At this time, the new magnetic shield blocked the discharge of the internal flood. Eric hurriedly let go of the control, and the flood in the bowl immediately flowed to the lower place. The large metal net floating in the air also dissipated after putting everyone on the ground. The flood danger in Wakanda was lifted. Eric let out a long breath and waved his hand towards the sky. Namor, trapped in the armor, flew towards the Wakanda palace. T'Chaka, kill him. He almost drowned Wakanda. When enemies meet, their eyes are red with envy. Seeing Namor tied up in the air and roaring non-stop, the queen picked up the dagger directly, ready to give him a chill at any time, her heart soaring. Unfortunately, at the critical moment, her man was not strong enough. Amanda, put down your weapons, forget it. T'Chaka's tone was filled with unspeakable fatigue. T'Chaka. He is the enemy of Wakanda. The queen looked incredulous. I've made a mistake once, don't make it a second time. T'Chaka gently held the queen's hand and took the dagger from her hand. Eric, are we still friends? T'Chaka looked at Eric, who was like an outsider, hesitantly. Eric said helplessly, T'Chaka, I said, I will always be a friend of Wakanda. Thank you. T'Chaka crossed his arms and performed a Wakanda etiquette to Eric, then, I'll leave Namor's affairs to you. Wakanda cannot be in opposition to Atlantis. Okay. Namor's affairs are actually easy to solve. Although he has a bad temper and a lot of bad habits, he is essentially a good person. The reason why he became so violent and bloodthirsty is entirely because Hydra has been conducting various experiments on him for a year, and the large amount of drugs and toxins left in his body made him unconscious. When Eric and T'Chaka broke into the underground base, Hydra was even more cruel and injected half a year's dose of drugs into Namor's body at one time, which made him crazy and did the thing of flooding Wakanda. Wakanda's medical technology is enough to remove these toxins, and coupled with Eric's electromagnetic pulse stimulation, Namor soon woke up. Namor was still frightened by the fact that he almost massacred Wakanda, but he was not the first to apologize because of his bad temper. Instead, he forcefully questioned T'Chaka why he wanted to kill him as soon as they met. T'Chaka had given up the idea of killing him, but he was the monarch of a country after all, and he was on someone else's territory. He still had to maintain the dignity and face of the monarch. Being questioned like this, T'Chaka could no longer hold back his anger. He didn't even bother to put on his Black Panther uniform, and went straight up to fight. Namor knew he was in the wrong, so he didn't dare to use his water control ability again. He fought with T'Chaka with pure physical strength. These two people, one is an Atlantean hybrid who can withstand the pressure of the deep sea, and the other has heart-shaped grass to strengthen his physical fitness. 
the fight is really exciting. The two fought back and forth, punching each other, neither of them gave in, neither of them gave in, their equally strong bodies erupted into a fierce collision, the onlookers around were excited. Wakanda does not have the custom of group fights, they have always emphasized one-on-one -on -one duels. At this time, King T'Chaka's behavior is very consistent with their tradition, so no one will go up to help. The queen, the prince, the palace guards, and Eric, a group of people played the role of qualified spectators, waving flags and shouting from time to time, cheering, and making the fighting parties add strength. The ending was soon revealed. T'Chaka had the advantage in this game. Everyone was cheering for him, and he was in high spirits and won a small victory. Namor was not so good. Not only did he fight away from home, but he also offended everyone before the war. He had done his best by not making trouble. Okay, both of you, calm down. If you have anything to say, sit down and have a cup of tea, and let's talk slowly. Eric acted as a peacemaker after the incident and pulled the two apart with a smile. The two of them also gave face, took advantage of the situation, dispersed, stared at each other and panted. I was wrong in this matter, I'm sorry. T'Chaka apologized to Namor dryly. It was my fault to flood Wakanda, I apologize. Namor had no expression. Eric slapped his forehead, is there anyone who apologizes like this? Are you sure you don't want to fight again? Okay, T'Chaka was wrong, but Namor flooded Wakanda and caused huge losses to Wakanda, which was also wrong. Fortunately, no one was killed this time. This matter ends here. How about you shake hands and make peace? T'Chaka and Namor still stared at each other, and no one was willing to take a step forward. Eric had to pull one of them with one hand and put their hands together. In fact, both of them wanted to make peace, but they were both concerned about face issues and were embarrassed to lick their faces. Now with Eric's help, they shook hands half-heartedly. Eric saw all this and found it a little funny. These two people who were so stubborn that they suffered in life. The next thing was much simpler. They ate and drank, and after a few cups of cat urine, the two who had originally regarded each other as enemies soon became close and intimate. Namor, why did Hydra want to capture you? During the meal, Eric asked a question that made people around him prick up their ears. When talking about Hydra, Namor's face was full of anger, how should I know? I just came back from a trip to the Arctic that day. I stayed in the sea for too long and wanted to go ashore to get some fresh air. But as soon as I came up, these came. It was nothing, just tens of thousands of people, and I killed them in minutes. The two or three hundred people mentioned by Hawkeye directly multiplied a hundred times to tens of thousands when it came to Namor. They were so stubborn. But later, those guys made a very strange weapon. I was knocked away before I even saw the attack. My ears were buzzing, my bones were numb, I couldn't muster up the energy, and I felt nauseous and dizzy, and then I was captured. When Namor said this, his face was full of palpitations. In short, he wanted to express that it was not that he was not strong enough, but that the enemy's weapons were too advanced. Sonic weapons. T'Chaka muttered in confusion. Eric shrank his neck and quickly diverted his attention. Namor, what did Hydra do in the underground base? They injected me with various drugs every day and drew my blood. Listening to their chat, it seemed that they wanted me to destroy the ground somewhere and grab a piece of meteorite. It was a mess. I couldn't remember it later. Namor's words made T'Chaka clench his fists tightly and pound. Hydra just wants to grab its own vibranium. Or prepare to grab the whole piece, pack it up and take it away, and don't plan to leave any residue for Wakanda. Hydra, conscience is broken. T'Chaka was thinking about how to deal with Hydra in his heart, and Eric was also thinking about Alexander's purpose. This guy probably wanted to come to Wakanda to get Vibranium, but didn't want to attack Wakanda directly, so he captured Namor, wanting to be a mantis catching a cicada while the Oriole was behind. Oh, by the way, a year ago, I was traveling in the Arctic and found something interesting. Namor took a sip of wine and suddenly remembered something. Eric and T'Chaka both looked at him, waiting for the next part. I found an ice-covered plane in the Arctic. There was a frozen person on it, and there was a shield next to him. It was amazing that he was frozen in the ice, but he was still alive. Thanks for watching, please subscribe and support our channel.